Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Let's talk about our friends over at Callahan's General Store. As a matter of fact, uh, tomorrow we'll have uh, our man Charlie Wilson on, and he'll talk about the uh, the. We'll talk some golf, of course. But he always comes on, the uh, general manager and CEO of Callahan's General Store, and he gives me some great tips on how to take care of my lawn. And I'm telling you right now, it's already looking much better uh, because I took some advice, but also because I went over to Callahan's General Store to get everything I needed to make sure that our lawn was looking top notch. We wanted to be uh that you know uh golf course condition beautiful lush and uh, beautiful and green and it takes some work it takes uh also some know-how and my friends over at callahan's they got all the supplies you need and they have the know-how as well uh it's a great place to go get all of your your fertilizers all of your bats of soil your amendments uh if you need the uh the weed and feed they got theirs with uh, that as well uh, also you got your pre-emergence there to make sure you're killing all the weeds the uh the crab grass and the dandelions they also have that over at Callahan General Store, everything you need. And if you're starting to plant a lot of your seedlings, you're starting to plant your vegetables, uh, starting to plant your trees, they got a variety of peppers and tomatoes and melons and other plants to choose from. Also, they have the pecan trees and the fruit trees there at Callahan General Store. So you want to start your spring off right, make sure that your lawn is looking top notch, uh, but also make sure that if you got that green thumb, that you're starting to plant all those vegetables um, and get them in the right place. My friends at Callahan's, they are the place for you. Go check them out. 501 Bastrop Highway between downtown and the airport. Every day is a great day to make it a Callahan's day. All right, welcome back to the Rodcast. Uh, time to get into some uh, Texas uh, football spring practice reports. There are more of the uh, reports coming out about uh, the scrimmage and uh, this weekend. Uh, some of the guys, some of the players who stood out at the scrimmage. A shout out to my man Chip Brown over at Horns 24-7. He had some uh, great reports. Uh, actually, there are, there's some bad news as well. Um, he actually mentioned that Cole Hudson was working at right guard uh, with the first team offensive line. Um, and he also mentioned that DJ Campbell left the scrimmage early. Uh, and they said that it, it could have been a shoulder injury of some kind, uh, minor shoulder injury. So he left the scrimmage early and uh, Trevor Gooseby ended up coming in, getting a lot of snaps with the offensive line as a result of that injury. Uh, so that's also one of the reports that uh, we didn't get into yesterday. Uh, shout out to my, my friends over at Horns 24-7 for that one. Um, also, uh, Chip Brown pointed out in his practice reports, sorry, scrimmage reports, that the running backs, once again, looked really, really, impressive uh starting with Jaden blue who might have had the best day overall actually a report said Jaden blue and trey weisner uh, probably had the best day for the offense during the team scrimmage period and the red zone uh work as well so running backs getting a lot of love uh that was also mentioned that cedric baxter uh looked really good so it looks like that running back room will be as good as advertised i think that's also 
um, a result, Patrick, of the offensive line being really deep. Um, Cameron Williams and Kelvin Banks, you got your bookend tackles there. You're so deep that DJ Campbell, shoulder injury, whatever it may be, doesn't necessarily affect you as much because you do have depth uh, on the offensive line. Um, whether you want to rotate seven, eight guys, or you're letting some of the young guys like Trevor Gooseby get a shot, they, you know, they have depth on the offensive line for the first time in a really long time. And I think run blocking actually is their strength. Um, I think pass blocking may be where I'm not saying they're going to struggle, but if they struggle anywhere, it'll be pass blocking and not run blocking. They're going to be pretty good, exceptional run blockers because as Sark has recruited, they're big humans. They can lean on yes. people and play bully ball. Yeah, yeah. The big humans, it's much easier to push forward than uh, than keep your feet and not trying to get pushed and, right. and stay yeah. in front of guys that are extremely well, extremely good at getting around you. Uh, but it is. It's why you want to build up your, your roster and why you've been why you start with offensive line when you're building a new team and trying to bring in the culture. Uh, Sark started with offensive line because he knew this is a process, a three- or four-year process to get to the point where if you have an injury or where if you have uh, somebody that you know isn't carrying their weight, you can have somebody next in line to step up for it. But I think this O-line, is it's going to be a full lot of fun to watch this year. And it's uh, it's definitely a good sign to see. That Sark, I think, too, if we can, Sark doesn't necessarily scheme the running game as well as he schemes the passing game. And so if we can say he can scheme that running game, he can scheme the passing game to try and have guys move around, get the ball out quicker, do those types of things. So if your pass offensive line, your your pass blocking O-line isn't as good as your run blocking O-line, you can scheme that a little bit more and then just trust your running backs and your O-line to do the work on the run game. Yeah. Um, no, you're right about that. So uh, I, I think it's right now one of the strengths of the team is, is the depth of the old line. They got a lot of talent too, but the depth on the old line. So uh, one of the reports we didn't get into yesterday, I've seen one of the uh, unfortunate reports. They do have an injury to DJ Campbell. We're not sure about the severity of it, but um, as a precaution, I believe they just took him out of the scrimmage. But then you just plug in a guy like Cole Hudson. Boom. And that's a guy that's had starter reps for you and you won't have a significant, if any, drop off at all because uh, you've been able to manufacture some depth on the O line. Uh, one of the other reports uh, here coming from uh, my man Chip Brown from the defensive side of things. Um, and we talked about this, too, uh, yesterday. There are a lot of reports that the guys on the edges looked really good. That Colin, a young Colin Simmons looked good. I believe my man Bobby Burton said he had two sacks uh, in the scrimmage. Um, he looked really good. They even um, look. They even talked about uh, Trey Moore and Baron Sorrell um, and some other reports coming out of the scrimmage that those guys made a lot of impact plays in the scrimmage. Um, so the edges, as we've talked about, that that should be a strength, uh, especially on the defensive line. And they're getting good work. I mean, they're going up against. Yeah, we talked about the O line. They're going up against Kelvin Banks. They're going up against Cam Williams. Uh, we talked about Trevor Gooseby. Um, that he had a good scrimmage. He got uh, some some love from some of the scrimmage reports as well. Uh, they're going. These are some of the battles that I think are going to really be able to help Texas um, because you you should have really good competition uh, going up against one on one competitions. Um, going up against uh, the DBs and the wide receivers, uh, tackles and the edges, because I do think you have now potential NFL guys working at the tackles, working at the edges, um, working at wide receiver, working at defensive back, potentially at cornerback specifically. And that's where uh, your, your one-on-ones take place in football is out on the edges, out on the perimeter. So you need those guys to be able to win those one-on-one battles offensively or defensively. Good to hear that you're getting a little bit of balance from the scrimmage reports. It's not one side yes. dominating the other, that you're also getting, oh, man, they're, the defense is winning their fair share. <laughs> yeah, you, you hate yeah. that. You always hate that uh, that report of one side dominating. Or, wow, your defense had four interceptions. Who was throwing the ball? Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in the spring, that's the word. It's like, oh, yeah, that's great. But then the other side, hey, man, what's going on? I haven't heard much. I will say this. Uh, there are a lot of reports coming out about how great the wide receivers look. Ryan Wingo looked really good. Um, uh, Chip Brown also mentioned Jonte Cook and Ryan Wingo had impressive receptions on Saturday um, from his sources. There's uh, There was also reports, that, other reports from my friends over at On Texas Football that Ryan Wingo looked really good. And a lot of the recruits were impressed with the wide receivers overall because it was a um, scrimmage that was open to a lot of the recruits. 
I haven't heard much about the DBs making plays. I will admit I've heard David Bender's name uh, came up in the scrimmage reports as a guy that played really well and that may be a leader right now leading the competition, um, not only a leader on the team, but a leader for that competition for the off-ball linebacker spot opposite Anthony Hill. And I have heard the deep, the defensive ends and the guys on the edges look good. Even here in Chip Brown's practice report, there's mentions of Alfred Collins and Vernon Broughton being stand out. So uh, the entire D line getting shout outs there line, Anthony Hills mentioned. So he's getting some love. I've heard, like I said, wide receivers, offensive line. We just mentioned, talked about them, Arch Manning and Quinn Ewers. Uh, there were reports that, um, Arch Manning had a 30 yard uh, touchdown. He threw it to Amari Nyblack and Quinn Ewers um, looked really good in the red zone that there were, I believe it was four uh, that was reported four consecutive passes in the red zone area. There were touchdowns from Quinn and Arch. So I'm just hearing good things about, good. you know, every position except DB. I haven't heard that one <laughs> script. Maybe it's because I'm looking for DB stuff. I haven't heard anything. I, you know, I'm Grounding of everything. Horns 24-7 does a good job. Uh, friends over at Owen Texas Football, they do a really good job, too. Um, Orange Bloods has some reports out about some guys haven't haven't seen anything about the DVs. Uh, that's concerning. I'm concerned. It's a little. Probably. It's a little concerning uh, because yeah. it was such a problem for Texas last season. Yeah. Some love about the DVs, man. I, but I, I will say this. I think that in scrimmages as well, uh, you lose a pass rush ability a little bit more. Because you can't really go full at a quarterback as much. And if you lose that, then it may hurt the DBs a little bit. And kind of what Texas is basing on this year is that pass rush should be better, which should help out the DBs. I'd like to see more about the DBs too, Rod. I agree with you. Uh, but uh, if I want to look at it a little bit uh, more glass half full is that uh, when you can't completely blitz and pass rush and try and when it, basically when a quarterback knows he's not going to get hit, he probably throws oh, yeah. the ball a little bit better. Oh, no, they got all day. I, I agree, but still, you know, I know, that's, I know. That's, as a DB, actually, I, I love that part of practice because then the practice is tougher than the games. Yeah. Because if I can cover a guy in practice, just practice, they get like four, five seconds to, to <laughs> then you're right. They, they have no, the quarterbacks, they have no pressure on them. Uh, you know, there are guys rushing them, but they know they can't get close to them or touch them. So, yeah, they do feel like they have a certain freedom. Uh, that they don't have in the games, and I, it makes my job harder. And I think for DBs, you still should be there. Still should be reports of them getting their hands on footballs. DBs make some plays. Haven't heard much. I'll admit that. Um, so I'm hoping maybe tomorrow some more scrimmage reports will come out about the DBs. But I've heard good stuff about almost every position um, except defensive back. I'll throw it out there. It's special teams, but I don't think they're doing much special teams in the scrimmage. Yeah, I've heard honestly. that too, is that people are saying that there's not really much reports about special teams. But yeah, I could imagine that that's more of just they're not, they're not yeah. doing a ton of it because it's a much more high contact thing exactly. in a lot of points. Yeah. And you just don't want to have a ton of high contact or this early on. Yeah, what are you going to I mean, you can't really practice a return game much. You can practice elements of it, but yeah. right, it's just too... Yeah, it's too much high impact stuff going on there. So they'll practice elements of it. So I don't I think we'll learn more about who the returners are. And they do have a lot of guys that could potentially be great returners for it. All right. So there you go. Some practice reports coming out. Sorry, the scrimmage reports coming out from spring practice. We come back, we'll get into my man Patrick's big fat poll of the day. And we'll also uh find out what the musically themed day of the week is. All that and more right here on the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis on Lifetime Long Run Rod Babers coming back on the horn.
Back on the broadcast here on a Tuesday morning, and it is a top of the charts Tuesday where we play music Mm -hmm. that was number one this day in history on the Billboard charts all show long, starting off with some temptations. Just Mm, beautiful. Nice and calm on a Tuesday morning, feeling good, waiting for the rain to come in a little bit. It's supposed to rain. I mean, it's it's been supposed to rain for the last... 12 hours, I, I think. They keep pushing it back for some reason. It's like, why are you pushing the rain back? It's supposed to rain yesterday. It's like, they pushed it back again. So yeah, it was getting rain. And then overnight, you're like, okay, well, maybe it'll rain. Well, no, no. When I woke up this morning, it was still dry. You're just trying yeah. to figure it out. But I think there was some, like, and it was in the air. You can like smell it a little yeah. bit. And I want to say there was some sprinkles, but no. Maybe yeah. So when I got in today, it said it was going to rain in the seven o'clock hour. So I have no idea. I, you can see behind me, there's, if you're watching on YouTube or Twitch or anywhere we're streaming it, that you can see that there's windows behind me, but they're closed. So I can't really see uh, if it's going, if it's raining or not. So, uh, but yes, hopefully that'll come soon. All right, let's get to uh, the big fat poll today. 512 447 3776 is the text line number. Patrick's big fat poll of the day on the horn. Big fat poll today today with UConn winning the championship last night. This is two in a row for UConn. Dan Hurley said last night, which we never know if it's true because there's already the speculation that Kentucky is going to offer him a contract and other teams Ooh. will try and snipe Dan Hurley away now that he has become the coach of, of everybody's eye, uh, that he is uh, that he said he wants to stay and create a dynasty at UConn is what he wants to do. And this dynasty at UConn would not be the fun type of dynasty. And I know there's not a lot of fun types of dynasty, but dynasties without star players, dynasties that don't really feature, you know, iconic players tend to be even more annoying <laughs> because you. you're just like, well, yeah. they just, they just kind of go out there and they're, they're all good. They're all really Execute. good, but yeah. they're not, there's not that greatness that you can at least ad- try and identify with and want to be that guy. There's no one you want to be on that team. <laughs> you just, so it's, that's true. That's a good point. So it's yeah, those dynasties, buying jerseys. <laughs> but maybe it is. Maybe there is a dynasty that does have that player that you can't stand, or maybe it's a coach you can't stand. So the question of the day, the poll of the day, which dynasty did you hate the most? Ooh, which dynasty did you hate, hate the most? Could you say, is it the Patriots dynasty? Was that a dynasty that you could not stand? Was it uh, go go some back? Don't say this. Some people might say the Spurs. The Spurs. Some people say the Spurs. The Celtics. <laughs> the Lakers are all dynasties in basketball. You could say you can go college football and say Alabama recently was a dynasty. You could go with that one and say you were annoyed with Alabama's dynasty. Uh, you can go. I mean, there's been plenty. That's good. There's been That's plenty good throughout the years, and I'm sure we're forgetting plenty. And I'm Cowboys not thinking, dynasty, the Cowboys dynasty. The Cowboys dynasty. Do people hate the Cowboys yeah. dynasty because of what the next 20 years was? Oh, 30 years? Man. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a good question about that. Hell, some people would argue even LeBron was a dynasty in himself still. I see. The, I think LeBron, <laughs> yeah, because LeBron would be his own dynasty, yeah. but, but it's been three different teams, yeah. so it yeah, kind of makes no. it harder. Um, no, that's good, though. That's a good question. You said most annoying or the one you hated the most? <laughs> I guess they should be the same. For me, yeah, that's interesting because my I, I was too young to be to hate the Cowboys dynasty, even though as a in you know kind of the rivalry between Houston and Dallas, and I, I love those players. I love Dion. The players were so fun to watch, so that wasn't it. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't yeah. know if I ever hated a dynasty because I actually appreciated dynasties. You see, you appreciate the dynasty. Yeah, I say, even I, the Spurs, I appreciate this. Even though I know the Rockets fans hate yeah. that the Spurs had a dynasty, <laughs> and even some people would say it's not. It wasn't a dynasty because you know what did Phil Jackson say about the dynasty? You got to win what back to back, win back to backs. You got to win back to backs. Dynasty. So you know, I think they are. I think they are a dynasty. Um, that could. I guess maybe that's the closest one, just because of the manner in which they built it. The the sheer luck involved. And I know they're, 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 the San Antonio Spurs don't need your luck. Like, they don't need yeah. luck because they're a quality organization. And, you know, they got great coaching. They got great development. They got great leadership. So they don't need the luck. But they've, they've still been arguably the luckiest franchise in sports. Because even with the lottery, how'd, you, how'd they get the number one pick again with Wimby? And then they got it yeah. with Tim Duncan. And when they get the number one pick, there's always like a generational talent available at the top of the draft 
or maybe they just maybe that's what happens when the Spurs meet up with a generational right. talent. They not they're not wasted and maximized. So I guess honestly, I'm gonna go with the Spurs because Spurs? the yeah, because I don't know how any organization can be that lucky that when a generational talent rolls around, they end up just getting the number one pick coincidentally. Like what, what, what the about, hell is that? What about the Yankees? Yankees don't affect me like that. The Spurs no, are closer. The Spurs are closer. The Spurs' excellence is closer to home. Like I said, the, the just I said the, the luck, the odds of that happening over and over again. Like how how do they, you can't keep doing this? I feel like that that mean <laughs> like like how do they keep doing this? Like what is going on? Like they got Wimby now. They had Tim Duncan, and it, and these are all unselfish superstars. Like they're like yeah. unselfish team first guys. Like what? Don't even want to seek free agency. But he's like, what is going on? How does that happen? How does the ultimate spur? end up being drafted by the Spurs every time with the number one overall pick. <laughs> it's amazing how right? that works out, isn't it? How it's the amazing. hell does that work out that way? Like, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Like, David Robinson and Tim Duncan, that's crazy. I think you said having Tim Duncan, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't throw it. Like, for me, it's got to be the Patriots just solely on because, Rod, you know my hatred of fake underdogs. And that yeah. franchise was, we're the most dominant dynasty in the last 10, 15 years of football. Nobody respects us. And that drives me nuts. Hey. <laughs> no, well, yeah, it's it's kind of a Boston thing too. Yeah. Like they, yeah, they take on kind of the the personality of the community. And to, listen, Tom Brady being drafted in the sixth round, he believes that all, all will always make him an underdog, no matter what he does. Dayton, Hollywood starlets, whatever it is, supermodels, he's a he's a he's an underdog forever. Friend. But you're right. I mean, he did go to Michigan. He did have a scholarship to Michigan. So you made your case for me. I agree with you. I was like, I actually, I you 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 made me at, change my opinion of Tom Brady as the you know perpetual underdog. No, you're right. He's not. He fooled us all. He fooled, he fooled yes. us all. He created he, a, great, he created yeah. a narrative that everybody bought into. It's, it was brilliant. You're right. It was brilliant. And he still to this day is like everybody's like, no, he's going to somebody's like actually. Uh, not really. There are there are better underdog stories than Tom Brady, but he's the goat. He's a goat. Yeah, um, I will say we've got we've got a, a number right now that are they're currently on cur on recency bias. There's a lot that are very upset with the Chiefs dynasty. Do not fans of the Chiefs yeah. dynasty. Okay, I'm not annoyed by the. This is good. This is a good discussion. We can have this on the other side because yeah. I'll, I'll I'm not annoyed by and I'll tell you why I'm not annoyed by the Chiefs dynasty on the other side. We can get into that too. You know what? I might I might become annoyed by it though. Because the Texans have this basically the Texans have been so irrelevant. Yeah. That maybe I haven't been annoyed by it, but maybe I'm about to be annoyed by it because the Texans are good again and they got to beat the Chiefs. So you're right. Maybe, you know what? Maybe I don't appreciate how annoying the Chiefs are. We'll get into that on the other side. Good question there. Good conversation for the big fat poll today. We'll come back and discuss that on the other side. I think that's got a lot of layers to it. Uh, we'll also get into this story about uh a potential holdout with C.D. Lamb with the Dallas Cowboys. Is that a reality or is that something um, that could could actually come to uh, come to pass for the Cowboys? We'll get into that coming up. we got Raj Ram today on the other side as well. All of that and more right here on the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Long Horn Rod Babers coming back on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Aside from the traffic, we all love the city of Austin and what's not to love. It's got uh, so many things uh, to offer, whether it be the great people, the great food, uh, has such a great culture, the live music. It's all fantastic. And also the uh, very unique uh, aesthetic appeal of Austin and what you may not know about all the iconic landmarks that make Austin so unique. A lot of them were built and created by the skilled craftsmanship of Ironworkers Local Union 482, uh, like 
the Pennybacker Bridge and the DKR Stadium. You might be driving by a lot of these landmarks right now and not even know it. The good folks over at Ironworkers Local Union 482 right now are building another big project right here in Central Texas, and they actually need your help. They're offering competitive wages, competitive benefits, and a pension plan. They even offer training for unskilled labor through their apprenticeship program. Now, they're hiring over 3,000 people, so these are a lot of different positions, folks. So if you're thinking about a uh, refreshing career change or maybe an, a new exciting employment opportunity or maybe you just want a new challenge or maybe you want to feel valued by your employer, you can become a valued member of this prestigious organization, Ironworkers Local Union 482. They've been around for a really, really long time and they've been doing business here in the city of Austin, uh, helping construct the infrastructure here in Austin and also helping build and helping grow uh, one of the great cities in America and you can be a part of it. Maximize your potential today and accept the challenge of becoming the best version of yourself by going online and you can inquire and you can also apply at ironworkers482.org. That's ironworkers482.org. That is a jam right there. I'm not going to lie. I was feeling that. There you go. Patrick, top of the charts Tuesday, one of my favorite musically themed days of the week. Uh, Patrick, the uh, the idea you know here on the show comes off with all the great ideas. Uh, came up with top of the charts Tuesdays when he plays jams. There is the top of the Billboard charts on this day in history. 
Uh, and yeah, that still bangs. I'm not gonna lie, that was that's pretty good. Yeah, it's, I, it's, I, I, it's, I it's pretty aggressive intro, but it works. <laughs> you know what? It's so it, I don't even know exactly. I, I would love to know what the inspiration was for the intro or whatever. And is it a video company with this or something? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I, no I, I, I don't know if there's a video because it's, it's back in the day. I mean, this is like early 70s. Okay, yeah, yeah. So definitely before the video period. I, I, I have no idea, but I've heard that intro before. But I don't think I've ever heard the the transition. Well, because it, it had the it had the uh, the reemergence with Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, you're right yeah. about that. That's definitely where I think I heard it recently. Um, but no, it jams. Like I said, I lo- I learned something new all the time from my man Patrick on Top of the Charts Tuesday. So we appreciate him there. Also, we always have a good conversation uh, from the big fat poll of the day. And that is the case once again uh, with today's topic. Uh, uh, Patrick, let the people know what your inspiration was for the big fat poll of today. Big fat poll of the day today. We're talking about dynasties because UConn. Won the title. Dan Hurley says he wants to stay at UConn and build a dynasty there. Back-to-back championships already in two dominant seasons of basketball. It's crazy, man. So we're asking you, which dynasty did you hate the most? Some of you are saying the ones you did, you still hate uh, in the Chiefs. I've seen as a popular answer. Yeah, I haven't hated them yet, but if they if they three peat, they're definitely going to be hated. If they get a three peat, they they deserve to be hated by everybody at that point. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, the Yankees are the one, you know, Yankees fall into because they had the most money and would just buy players. And it was frustrating because if you had a good player, he would just end up on the Yankees. And every time you'd see it, they would just That's buy true. another player. So it was frustrating because you were like, this this doesn't seem fair that they just, yeah, and then Yankees yeah, sure. fans were everywhere. That's also a part of a lot of these dynasties is how many fans are you around? That is true. That's a, that's why the Spurs things are annoying to me because yeah. they were they're always around now. Where <laughs> here in Austin, the Spurs fans, I mean, they represent. And yeah, no, that's like I said, I'll probably be in a minority here, but for me, it is like I said, the luck of the Spurs. It's like a luck of the Irish. Like it's it's amazing how they as a quality organization, but they've had some of the best luck all time in the history of the NBA. To, to get the players, yeah. the generational talents they get, and not just generational talents, they get these great character human beings who also happen to be generational talents. Every time they get the number, they're in the lottery to get the number one overall pick. I don't know how that continues to happen. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I have to see. <laughs> like, I have somebody to see if explain I, it to me. I'll just find some audio of another clip I heard Wemby talking about yesterday. That was what? is a high character stuff that everybody loves. Yeah, he doesn't want. To, he's like, oh, I always want to be a spur. I don't want. I don't want to ever leave. I don't want to ever leave. I, I've been dreaming about this my whole life, and it's like you've been dreaming about being a San Antonio Spur your whole life, and I understand why because of the French connection. I get it, but it's like, <laughs> who says that? Who would any young player say that in the United States of America? No, but they happen to get the generational talent, and we'll talk Wimby actually later on the show because some Wimby news. Um, but they happen to get that guy. Then the Tim Duncan before that, they get the mo- one of the most unselfish superstars in the history of the NBA. Who doesn't want to be in a glamour city? He doesn't. How many most uh, most uh, you know great all time greats? They're worried about their brand, and you know I gotta have my image. I gotta hit yeah. a bigger market. And it's like, no, nah. Tim Duncan's like, no, nah, I'm good, man. I love this. Spencer Spurs is perfect for me. This is exactly where I want to be. Low key, you know, kind of off the the beaten path. Hey, I don't like. You know, it's not a small market, but you know, it's a low key market. Yeah. And and he ends up being the perfect compa- they, They're perfectly compatible. Like usually superstars aren't perfectly compatible with the organization and the culture and they keep getting these guys, man. And it's upsetting because now Wimby's going to be there for another 20 years. It's just like they had Duncan for 15 years. Like they, it's amazing. Yeah. Like how does that happen? I, all right. David Robinson you, before that. I was you, this is a Rockets fan. Uh, the Bulls dynasty. Was that a problem because they were done? Did that mean, now, because this is the deal. I don't, he asked, the texter asked, does anybody not like the Bulls dynasty? And he go, I didn't like the Bulls dynasty. But I did not. I did not have the same hatred for them. Partially because the Spurs weren't as great then. It's not like the Spurs were making it to the finals and then losing. And then the Rockets fell into that two-year span where they won their two titles in between. So there's somewhere in the middle too on that. But I, I feel like that was a team that, if you were, I guess if we were at Eastern Conference, you maybe get a little bit more upset with them that you get knocked out. Like the Pacers, the Pacers would probably say that. Pacers fans, yeah. No, you're right about that. The Bulls dynasty, I was I was young and I was caught up in, you know, I want to be like Mike and Michael yeah. Jordan's goatness. And so I don't think it it annoyed me at all. And you're right. Maybe I was removed from it because I hadn't really embraced. And then the Rockets won their two championships when MJ took his break. 
which you know, I mean, so that they never really had to face off. I think if, if MJ would have had to face those Rockets teams, then maybe I would at this point hate hate that that Bulls dynasty more. Yeah, but I, and like you said, it, it, I, I was unaffected by it. Like the Kansas City Chiefs, I do believe now that the Texans are good and they're relevant again, and now are a top three or four team in the AFC. Now I'm probably gonna learn to hate that Chiefs dynasty. Yeah, because they're not ready to beat the Chiefs, but they're they're good enough to compete to get to the Chiefs, but they're not good enough to beat the Chiefs. And therefore, yes, I'm going to hate the Chiefs after they beat the Texans, hopefully in the AFC title game, and then go on to win another Super Bowl. Because right now, I ain't picking against Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid. Now, do you think you? You, think, you think your buddy uh, <laughs> Kyle Shanahan may have a problem with the Chiefs? Oh, yeah, you're asking who he is. <laughs> that is definitely the dynasty. If he had answered this question, yeah, we all know how Shadow, we all know how Shadow would answer. There's no doubt. He hates this Chiefs dynasty. He's got to. He's got to, yeah. Oh, man. I never thought about that. That is heartbreaking. All right. Uh, good stuff there. That's the big fat poll today. So hit us up on the text line, 512 447 3776. I'm going with the Spurs, damn it. I'm going with the Spurs. How the David Robinson, Tim Duncan, and Wimby? What the? It ain't, you know what I mean? Come on, man. That don't make any damn sense. Can we get, can they get a bust on their hands? Anybody? Can they get a guy that's got at least bad care? The Kawhi thing, but that wasn't the number one overall pick. It's not number one. You know what I mean? But Kawhi we, was the guy they traded for, trade, yeah, we traded mean, up to get. The, the, the first when they did when they got Patty, they got Josh Primo, and then they had to cut him after he was showing his junk to people. Yeah, allegedly. That's true. Yeah, so there, it, there were there's bad picks. But he's in not there. the number. They're not the top. He wasn't number one. Yeah. Yeah, man, come on, man. You admit that's it, the luck the Spurs hey, have. It's been hey, unbelievable. Let's, let's let's be clear. If they get their one pick this year, it's not going to be a superstar. <laughs> <laughs> That is fair. Well said. Well said. <laughs> that streak may be done with. There you go. All right. Uh, before we get to Rod's rant and we we'll get to this uh, CD Lamb discussion, uh, let my man Patrick update us and educate us with the, and inform us with the horn headlines, with the big headlines of the day. All right, your horn headlines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. The UConn Huskies won their second straight national championship last night, defeating Purdue 75-60, to completing a dominant two-year run. Purdue's Zach Eady carried the load for the Boilermakers early and ended with a 37 and ended with 37 points. However, it was not enough as the Huskies defense smothered the rest of Purdue's roster to once again pull away in the second half. UConn now sits atop the early rankings to repeat once again next year while Purdue looks to find a new anchor with Zach Eady moving on. Texas baseball looks to bounce back after a disappointing series loss to BYU last weekend in a two-game home and away miniseries with Texas State. Chase Loomis will take the mound for Texas against a Bobcats team that beat Texas earlier this season 11-10 in Houston during the Astros Foundation College Classic. In the NBA, all three Texas teams are in action tonight as they begin the final week of the regular season. The Rockets will face the Magic. The Spurs take on the Grizzlies with former Longhorn Timmy Allen recently called up to the roster, and the Mavs go up against the Hornets. Mavs fans will also be uh, paying attention to the Clippers and Suns matchup with both teams closely surrounding Dallas in the standings. And in Major League Baseball, the Rangers and Astros split their series 2-2 after a 10-5 Houston victory. Framber Valdez was a late scratch from the lineup with elbow soreness, and replacement Blair Henley was put in to begin the game, giving up five runs and only getting one out. However, the Astros' bats were able to battle back in even, this, in even the Silver Boot series. The two teams will face each other again in Houston after in a weekend series, after the Astros take on the Royals this week and the Rangers face the A's with the first game coming tonight with pregame beginning at 630 right here on the horn. And that is your horn headlines. Thank you, Patrick, for the horn headlines. Much appreciated there. All right, let's get to this news because Michael Gelkin covers the Dallas Cowboys for Dallas Morning News. Um, he noted in a column recently that a, a potential situation could be looming for the Cowboys. Um, and a CD Lamb holdout potentially could be looming. Now, the Cowboys were to start their spring workout program April 15th, barring a contract extension um, when complete, uh, which is ex- expected for CD Lamb. Everybody's expecting him to get a contract extension and be the highest paid receiver in NFL history, which, like I said, I, I believe it's going to put him above the 30 million because I think Tyreek Hill is close to 30 million a year. I got to go check that out. Um, but he says Lamb won't take the field unless it's expected he won't take the field for the uh, April 15th spring workouts for the Cowboys unless that extension is done. 
um, Lamb's agent, Tori Dandy, did not respond to a request for comment on whether Lamb will accompany teammates at Ford Center at the start for the Cowboys spring workouts. But of course, Dandy and Lamb are aware attendance is voluntary for the bulk of spring. Um, he, uh, the Cowboys know that. It says here um, that in this piece for Michael Gelkin, everybody goes about it. Stephen Jones said, everybody goes about it a different way. Um, we've had guys who have been around. Um, Ezekiel Elliott was never around when he was waiting for a contract. So we've dealt with both. We respect, uh, he said, we respect Zeke, but you prefer that they're around uh, when they're under contract. It's part of the business. You don't love it, but it's part of the business. Um, so basically that was for the, that's the way they handled the Zeke situation. And he's basically saying if they treat it the same way they treat it, Zeke, if they treat CD Lamb the same way, it won't be a big deal for the Dallas Cowboys, but it could be a statement by CD Lamb just early on that, Hey man, you know what? Until I get this deal done, I'm not going to be around. Now <clears throat> CD Lamb was spotted at a celebrity basketball game recently. Um, TMZ had this story actually. And it's a little uh, some audio there, but he basically was asked if he's going to be in Dallas. He said, I'll be in Dallas. He did not say anything about whether he would be there for the spring workouts. Didn't say anything about whether he would be holding out. He just said, I'll be, yeah, I'll be in Dallas. Those were his words. Yep. I'll, yeah. I'll be in Dallas. Um, he didn't specify what, so I, he will be in Dallas. I'm not, I don't, think that there's any doubt that he'll be a Dallas Cowboy in the future. Now, if the Cowboys decide to move on from Dak Prescott and, you know, move on from him and then blow this whole thing up, then I think there's a chance even if they sign CD, maybe they sign and trade CD. Um, and maybe, you know, Michael Parsons, the same thing. But right now, I think the assumption is CD Lamb will be a Dallas Cowboy going forward. Uh, it's just about how much the Cowboys are going to pay him. And the Cowboys right now, there have been crickets. Remember I said it's very interesting that we haven't heard a lot about CeeDee Lamb's contract extension. Um, we know Michael Parsons is they picking up the fifth-year option with him, so maybe that's their plan going forward. But very interesting that we haven't heard anything about that, and maybe that is tied to Dak Prescott also playing out the last year on his contract this year potentially. And if that is the case, maybe the Cowboys' version, as we've talked about, of all in is – everybody's on a contract year, which would be oh, general manager malpractice to say the yeah. least, because those, if those guys go into next year and have another career year, whether it be statistically or whether it be in terms of them making a, a, a play, a deep playoff run, then you got to pay everybody the highest dollar figure and the highest value figure for in the market. And they would have the free agency, the free agent market to negotiate with as well to push up there to push their value and to push the price up that right now you're trying to get guys at a value and that right now the cowboys are playing with fire if they don't re-sign one of these big three guys Dak or extend one of these big three Dak, cd or micah yeah and they've shown in the past they don't necessarily love paying wide receivers market value they don't they don't ever believe a wide receiver is worth as much as that is that's why they didn't like when they didn't want to pay amari cooper they never wanted to pay des bryant that was always a deal and I think, you know, as we talked about this a little bit with the Micah Parsons stuff, you know, throwing out that Zeke didn't show up either, I think is a little bit of Stephen Jones trying to tell fans, look, you saw what happened with Zeke. He didn't want to show up. And then, you know, his production went down and we had to cut him and he took all this money and really hamstrung our team. That's what CD's trying to do to you guys, too. Yeah, I, I think there's I think there's a little You're bit right. of him trying to win public uh, public discourse of that he's saying that this is a look, we saw what happened. You saw what happened with Zeke. You saw, but unfortunately, the CD Lamb, he just wants to get paid. So he's probably not even showing up because he wants, he so desperately wants that money. <laughs> you go, of course he does. He's earned it. Of course he does. He's, he's earned a, it. I was saying exactly. He's, he's an all he pro this a, year. He had an amazing year uh, as a wide receiver. So I, I get, I, I see why Steven Jones is doing that. But yeah, I think it, I think throwing Zeke's name in there was much more of a, trying to show what could be done what what could happen if if uh, if a player does you know holds out and then doesn't produce is that eventually yeah. you have to get cut uh yeah when you're out when you're underperforming um your contract like that i agree and the highest paid receiver is tyree q he's making 30 mil a year so that's what cd's gonna get and then you gotta so you gotta you gotta have the highest paid receiver in nfl history highest paid defensive player in nfl history and dak is gonna be 
at least in the top three highest paid quarterbacks, right? Once he signs his extension. Yeah. That's a lot of money. Well, that's and then bread. that's a lot of bread. And that's talking about, do you space it out where you put more on the back end, which makes it almost impossible to then trade a CD lamb because he's got so much guaranteed money on a back end of a contract because you don't want it. Your salary cap is already situations kind of screwed up with all your dead money and everything that's going into the next couple of years. So how do you do you backload it? But then no one wants to take on a $45 million wide receiver in three years. See if you're trying to trade him. So it makes him untradeable if you're going to blow up your team or do you, you know, I, I just don't know if you're, if you're really thinking we may blow it up, this contract negotiation becomes extremely difficult because you don't know how much money you're going to have to spend in the next year versus the years down the road. Now I'm with you. I just, uh, it's for the Cowboys. It's a tough situation to be in that all these contracts right now are due and the, all these, it, it's a, like I said, all these guys are performing really well. They're all pros. Yeah. They're be- Dak's best season ever. You got Micah Parsons, who's an all pro. You got CD Lamb, who's an all pro, but you got to pay these guys. And I think the Cowboys are uncertain about what they want to do um, in terms of the, the, the championship window, how they want to extend it, if they want to extend it, if they want to blow it up and start again. I don't know if they're certain. And based on the, the status of the head coach, the defensive coordinator, C.D. Lamb, and Michael Parsons, Dak Prescott, everybody's essentially is on a one-year deal right now. Right now. That could change tomorrow. Yeah. But right now, everybody's lame duck. Everybody's on a one-year deal. That's wild. That's just a crazy situation to be in. You think going forward, you'd be like, you know, as an organization, all right, we want to sign our foundational pieces, whether it be the quarterback or whether it be the best defensive player. Cowboys aren't going that route right now. It's, it's just a, the most peculiar offseason I think I can remember for the Cowboys in a really long time. Um, but I think it's just because of what I think they were so they did not expect to get whipped like like by the Packers like that <laughs> in the first round of playoffs. They just did not it it, it, yeah. it shell shocked the organization. Because they well, everybody had their mindset on NFC title game. We got to get past the division around. Once we get to the division round, we got to get past the division round. And it's like, man, y'all look past the the the, the lowly Packers and we're thinking about the division around. And I think the organization is still shell shocked from it. It, I think it, it is, and I think it's just – I think what's weird is – in last year, we got a kind of a hint of it, but, it, you know, there's always so much hype around the off-seasons and the Cowboys, and there's always so much hype, uh, not in, in just in free agency, but look at the guys we're getting back and the Cowboys putting out hype of their players, the Cowboys putting out hype of what's coming and what's happening. And last season, it felt like there was a little less of it. In this season, it feels like there's none. It feels like there's no hype coming from the Cowboys. It's only talking about how they're not signing an extension for Dak and he wants too much money and CeeDee Lamb wants too much money and Michael Parsons wants too much money. That feels like the only real narrative to come out is, well, if we give all these guys money, we can never win a championship. And that, like, trying to skew the narrative that way, the narrative is not, guys, we're about to go win a ring, which it feels like it's been the last, it, what, 10 years for Dallas that that's been the narrative, at least the hype coming out of there. Selling hope. Yeah. Selling hope. Selling it, hype. it feels like they're not selling hope anymore. Yeah, it feels like, well, I think it's a tough sell. It is. I think it's a tough sell after what you watched. Never in stopped the them like, before. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Very true. Great point. You're right. Never stopped them before. Yeah, something right now. You're right. Something stopping them from selling it, and I don't really know what, what that could be. Uh, all right. Uh, good conversation there. We, uh, let's get to Rod's rant while we got a little time here. Let's get to Rod's rant. It shouldn't take long. Paul Feinbaum will be, uh, I think, the topic here. Let's get to it. All right, let's get to uh, this audio of Paul Feinbaum. He was on uh, an SEC podcast where he was asked about, I think it's that SEC podcast, actually, maybe the name of it. Um, where well, I, don't know, I don't know exactly what he was asked about, but he was speaking <clears throat> about Texas and Texas A&M. Uh, we'll just play the audio, then we'll come back and react to it. Here is Paul Feinbaum. Surprised. Uh, hmm. uh, because they, they felt uh, that, they had been promised that AM would never come in. And they were promised. And uh, Texas would never come in. But things change. 
Yeah. And 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 it's A and M's fault. You're supposed to ask why. Oh yeah, yeah why? Why? Yeah, yeah I was, I was, I was thinking that. <laughs> <laughs> One, two, three. Uh, <laughs> the re A and M was so successful in the SEC, cousin Shane, that uh, Texas said we want some of that. I mean, it really. Yeah. It, it, I mean, they Texas in 2010 was heading to the Pac-12. I mean, they had already commandeered uh, a bunch of schools because they wanted to be more aligned with the Pac-12 academics, uh, the Stanfords, mm -hmm. the Cal's, yeah. right. <laughs> what's now in the ACC. <laughs> uh, and they finally realized we, we need to do something. And Texas could have gone to the Big Ten, ACC. I mean, all this nonsense that we heard from, oh, well, the SEC. The SEC didn't do anything but answer a phone call uh, from yeah. their their attorneys answered a phone call, the same phone call that uh, that everybody else got. They were they were on the prowl. They were leaving it, and they were going to go somewhere. All right, I think um, a lot of that is true. I think there's some <laughs> stuff that's uh, a little iffy. Um, Might be I'm, a little I'm bit of a narrative from the SEC, and yeah, it seems like some of it, yes, is a very kind of pro SEC propaganda, you know, standpoint. There, uh, I'll just say this: uh, I do think because I'm not, I'm not an Aggie hater. You guys know that. I'm not. I was almost an Aggie myself, so I'm not an Aggie hater. Um, I'll give the Aggies props for two things. I think the Aggies early on realized that the SEC was just a better overall option. And Texas realized that later on there's a better overall option for their program and the profile of their program. They got the bump from the SEC and it did. It, it I think it lifted the overall brand and the profile of the Aggies. And they, in the first year I said, they'd go there and win double digit games. And they did. They had the Johnny Manziel year. Now they had, and when he's talking about success to the Aggies, they haven't had much success on the field. I say much, they've had some, but not as much as they expected or anticipated. Uh, the success has been more about the branding and the expansion of the brand and brand recognition for them. They, you know, they got into a little beef with Nick Saban and, and uh, had, you know, that they had a little rivalry going on with Alabama for a hot minute, you know, this, this just things that normally at the Aggies wouldn't be mentioned and wouldn't necessarily be considered. The Aggies had a new found relevance when they went to the sec. So they got that bump. Uh, and, and by the way, I think they were right in, in saying, and at least predicting it would increase their profile and also increase the money, the dollars overall. Also, Texas under, un, I would say the Texas underestimated the power of SEC branding and recruiting as well. Um, I, I've talked to some of these young recruits. We've talked to them over at On Texas Football. I've seen interviews. I mean, Jerry Hamilton has done, and CJ Vogel have done with with guys like Anthony Hill and Colin Simmons and some of these other superstar players. And it matters to play in the SEC to them. It didn't matter really when I was being recruited where you played. The school mattered, but not the conference. But I guess that was before Tim Tebow and Urban Meyer and Nick Saban turning the SEC into the premier conference to play football. And now these young players, the elite players coming out, the blue chips, it matters. It's part of their evaluation. Like, no, no. And part of their uh, recruitment and consideration is like, no, I want to play in the SEC. And we see that now. And I think Texas also underestimated that. That did help in recruiting. And it didn't matter to recruit. It didn't matter when I was when I was coming up. I think Texas may be a little bit arrogant that, oh, no, no, we're Texas. It, the, the, the conference doesn't matter. Uh, and it does. And I think Texas ultimately, they didn't follow the Aggies to the SEC. And it's unfortunate that they they they, they left the SEC. So they left the Big 12 to get uh, underneath the shadow of Texas. And now the shadow is following them. <laughs> so I do empathize and sympathize with the Aggies a little bit in that regard. But the, the, the Longhorns went to the SEC because of the lack of leadership in the Big 12. And this is for, before they got Brett Yarmark. But with the changing landscape of NIL, Transfer Portal, and the continued um, the kind of delegitimized uh, NCAA that we continue to uh, un basically reveal and expose, I should say, more than anything, I think Texas was scared to have their program in the hands of the leadership of the Big 12 at the time. And Greg Sankey and the SEC offer much more stabilized, visionary leadership about the few, about in any position to be able to maximize all their brands with whatever the future of college footballs will be, which none of us actually know what it's going to look like. And if it, if it, with all that uncertainty, do you really want, you know, 
Bob Bosby or whoever it was to decide what happens to the University of Texas? No, I'd rather be with, it, with that sta- more stable leadership. And I think that's ultimately why Texas went there. Dollars and money. Texas is going to make money. Texas, you know, as Raymond Combs said, got more money than anybody except the Catholic Church. They got plenty of money. And they'll make more money in the SEC. I don't think it was, it was about money, but not ultimately the, I don't think, the biggest deciding factor. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, and the NCAA is guilty of this, too, is in an attempt to try and level the playing field, they ask you to meet in the middle. And if you say, we want you to, you know, meet in the middle with with Oklahoma State, you say, okay, well, foot on the field, that's not a hot problem. But if you want to talk about off the field, you want us to meet in the middle. We have to lower ourselves, and they have to raise themselves. And it's great to raise themselves, but we don't ever want to lower ourselves to meet in the middle on that financially we're talking about stadium size all these things it's it, i'm not talking about football playing on the field i'm just talking about all the other factors that go into it viewership television ratings all of that if you want us to meet in the middle we're having to hurt ourselves why would we want it why would texas want to do that so yeah. texas says we want to go somewhere where even if you know we sometimes we you know we have to compromise and do whatever else the the people in charge want to make us stars and not use us to make other people stars. And in the Big 12 with Bob Bowlesby, it felt like much more because there was much more have-nots than haves in term of uh, in terms of major college programs that were getting major viewing and and that you know the major networks wanted that they were trying to lift everyone up through Texas through Oklahoma. And in the SEC, you don't have to deal with that anymore. You don't have to no. deal with that because they already have their their situation built, and they want to make Texas one of their prime examples because they're going to make money off of that. And it just fell at a certain point. But that this has been going on for long enough that they wanted to do it to the Pac-12 too. That they said, okay, we can go over to the Pac-12 and, and get rid of this place. Uh, but I think it was just there was too much of it where Texas was being used to elevate others, and it brought Texas down more than they were being lifted up. And at, how long can you do that before it becomes a bad financial decision? Well, that's what's happening in the ACC right now. Yep. It's the same yeah, 100%. thing. That's literally, that's Florida State believes that, and the Clemson, that's why you have no, those that's schools. The, the NCAA and the college ball playoffs, when they say, well, we need to have these smaller teams in, they go, smaller teams aren't drawing ratings. The smaller team, nobody cares. So we don't, we don't want to have that because we get you want to lift up these smaller schools. I get that. But at the cost of us is not worth it. Yeah. And that's what's happening. The separation of the have and have not. So yeah. it is. So I I understand what Paul Feinbaum, he's an SEC guy. So everything's kind of an SEC agenda there. So some of the stuff he said, I think, actually was factual and substantive. And a lot was just uh, SEC propaganda. But that's all right. Uh, no, that Texas is a part of the SEC now. And Texas now, you know, the Aggies, you know, they, they made the SEC a part of their brand. Branding. Like they they – they were they led with that. It will be interesting to see if Texas leads with that kind of how the Aggies did. I don't know if Texas will lead with that. They're just a part of the SEC. Uh, the Aggies were leading with, you know, we are now an SEC brand. And it was good for them, by the way. It worked for them. It worked for them. It was a really good move by the, by the Aggies. And they're just upset that Texas decided, all right, you know what? The Aggies were right. And I'll admit, Aggies, you were right. You were right. Is that what you want to hear? I think that's what you want to hear. You were right. Yeah. The SEC was a better conference to go to, and you saw it before the, you know, the the Longhorns and before the the, the the Longhorn leadership, and you were mocked at first for going to the SEC, and you were laughed at and ridiculed, and now the Longhorns are following, you know, yeah. not following your path to the SEC. Yeah, you, I, mean, I will admit that that is true. Yeah, that is and, true. and a stop clock is right twice a day. Yeah, exactly. It's always saying I get. Yeah, we can admit that exactly. I'm not saying that they they made every good move since uh, with the Jimbo Fisher contract and all that kind of stuff. But they that was that was a that was a great move by the Aggies, and they don't get Jimbo Fisher there unless they make that move to SEC and the Johnny Manziel years and all that kind of uh, stuff. All right, uh, there you go. Uh, we'll come back. We'll get into a couple of stories. Uh, there's a Wimby story I want to get to, and then we finally got to address this LeBron, Bronny James story. What the hell is going on there? So we'll talk a little NBA on the side. All that and more right here on the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers coming back on the horn.
Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Uh, if you're sitting in traffic right now, you're probably in a bad mood. I mean, let's be honest. Traffic puts everybody in a bit of a bad mood, but you could be in a better mood in traffic if you were sitting in a car that you really enjoyed. And so if your car's a little run down and maybe your car right now just doesn't fit your lifestyle, maybe you need something bigger, maybe you need to downsize, uh, maybe your car's giving you a lot of problems, and you just need something new. Maybe you just want to enjoy that new car smell. Whatever the reason, you're in the market for a new automobile. My friends at App Leasing, they can help you out. They have the ability to put you in any make or model vehicle that you want. The professionals over at App Leasing can help you get the price you want, the payment you want on the car that you want. Uh, it's, all it takes from your end is one simple phone call or just click on Apple Leasing's website and you'll get a quote on any make or model vehicle that you want. You can even get at the uh, the value of your estimate right over the phone. Apple Leasing, simple, interest, easy lease makes the entire process simple and easy. Uh, they want to make sure that you have a lot of flexibility, which is going to give you more possibilities and options to help you find the vehicle that fits you best, but more importantly, the vehicle that fits your budget best. Uh, trying to navigate uh, the uh, the car uh, industry can be really, really tough. It can be a bit of a headache. It can be stressful. My friends at Apple Leasing, they want to take that off of your plate. You call them. You let them know what your specifications are. You let them know what kind of car you want, an, an SUV or a sedan or a truck. You let them know what color you're looking for. You let them know the year. You give them all the details. They'll do all the legwork. They'll uh, vet all the dealers and the dealerships for you. They'll do all the research and go down the rabbit hole. Uh, they'll make sure uh, that you get the best bang for your buck and the best bargain. If you're right now, you're in a bad lease, they'll get you in a better lease. That's what my friends at Apple Leasing can do for you. They understand that your time is valuable, time is money, and they're going to save you both. Save your time and money and also find you tremendous value. Everything seems overpriced these days. That's why leasing makes more sense than ever. You're only paying for the part of the car you're actually using. So give them a call. 512-346-9977. That's 512-346-9977. Or visit AppleLeasing.com. That's AppleLeasing.com. All right, top of the charts Tuesday. That's when Patrick the Idillionaire plays jams. that reached the top of the Billboard charts on this day in history here on the Rodcast. Uh, so we appreciate all of uh, his efforts and creativity. He's also an NBA junkie, a basketball junkie pretty much. So I know he's been paying attention to this story. This, um, this Bronny James story is very interesting. So if you haven't heard and will – um, play some sound from the new USC head coach, Eric Musselman. He actually um, was asked about Bronny James and what's going on with him. And he really didn't know. I don't think he knew. We played the LeBron James sound actually when the news broke of him hitting the transfer portal. And LeBron James actually did not have any clarity on the situation either. Uh, I'm sure he knows more, but he was not willing to divulge. And um, apparently now the latest report is that he's also 
declared for the NBA draft, as well as he's in the transfer portal, but also simultaneously declared for the NBA yeah. draft as well. Yes. He's both. Yes. So I guess he's just keeping his options open. Here. Yes. It's not, that's um, not rare anymore, by the way. That, that's not that, rare anymore. Okay. No, so no, that, that is, that is a more and more common thing now. Okay. Because more and more now, people are basically being told they you can declare for the draft and maintain your eligibility. And okay. so they want to go to the draft. They do not want to stay in college. They're done. They're not having a good time where they're at. So they are ready to move on. And they will go to college, and the basic reports will either be, and what they've heard was, well, you're not helping your draft stock here anymore. If you stay here, you are not helping anything. So you either have to go somewhere else and kind of reinvent yourself, re, you know, learn a new hold, yeah. learn what you're doing, and, and you can go to a new coach, learn some other things, or you can go to the draft and try and make it up that way. But it's it's more common because basically they're trying to figure out, am I a first-round pick? Am I a second-round pick? Do I go undrafted? If I go undrafted, I'll probably go back to school because I'll make more money at NIL if I come back to school, and then I can pick where I want to go, and then I can get the NIL building up and, and go that route. But again – a lot of this falls into two in the world of the one and dones. And a lot of these kids would have just come straight out of high school into the pros if they could. Yeah. A lot of these kids have no intention or care ever about playing college basketball. That's just the path to the NBA. And so they take it. That's what a lot of these people are doing uh, that are doing that transfer portal in the transfer portal and the draft. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, no, nice clarification there. So that it's, it's kind of a new, a new thing. Just keep yeah. your options open. Eric Musselman was asked, and this was actually last week, he was asked about Bronny James' situation and if he knew anything, and here's what he had to say about it. Well, I mean, I need to try to get a hold of Bronny. I've, uh, I've texted him. Certainly, he's got a lot of options, and, uh, you know, we, we respect those options, and uh, we just want him to know that, hey, you know, this opportunity here, if, if, you, if you want to play at USC, we'd love to have him. And, uh, such a talented young man, and, and uh, you know, but again, he's got a lot of a lot of opportunities, and so it's just a matter of us connecting. And hopefully, we'll do that soon. Okay, so LeBron James is not revealing anything. Coach, his new coach, doesn't know anything. Was well, I don't even know his new coach because he's in the transfer portal. Yeah. So uh, the guy at the the, uh, the uh, former school that he was at, a former university he was at, he doesn't know anything about it. So it, there is a lot of kind of cryptic information out here about what Bronny James is doing. And I don't even know if he and you're the NBA guy and we have some sound of Kendrick Perkins talking about Bronny James as an actual NBA prospect. This is this kind of reminds me of the Caitlin Clark discussion we were having. You're like, yeah. is anybody talking about the actual basketball here? <laughs> <laughs> is anybody talking about the, the scheme and the matchup between yeah, yeah. these two teams and who has the advantage? That's what I feel like that about Bronny James. I feel like all we talk about is Bronny James and um, what he's doing and where he's going. And nobody talks about his actual game, his skill set as a player. Have you have you watched a lot of Bronny James? I've, I've not watched a lot. I've watched some Bronny James. I've read scouting Bronny reports. James. I've watched highlights. And, and – and the reality is, is basically as of right now, his peak as of right now, unless something happens and he drastically gets better ball control, better shooting, all that, which can't happen, is he's a three and D guy is really what they're building him up to be okay. at this point. He's a really good frame on him. Uh, he's He's got good footwork. He's got a lot of things to make him a three and D guy. The problem is he does not have, he fully have his dad's body control which that's the thing that made LeBron James a much different player defensively was LeBron James could play really good defense without fouling. And Bronny has not got quite that ability that I think if you take him to a higher level, he's going to get in foul trouble a lot because as much as there is a lot of nepotism in this story, the refs that's don't true. care. That's true. So, and uh, Sham, sh oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no I'm just saying, so that's at the end of the day, your reality is if the, if the refs are going to call you as a rookie, you lose that part of the, the thrill that everyone else is going to get out of it if you're constantly on the bench because of foul trouble. That's a good point. Sham Sharania, to your point about the defender thing, because he's right on he's right on the same, or at least this this tweet, or at least this statement is right on, uh, on board and aligning with what you're talking about. He said, When I talk to NBA teams, there's a clear consensus that as a defender, he's already at that caliber of an NBA defender. That's what Sham Sharani on uh, Bronny James. And we have some audio of Kendrick Perkins. Yes. This is Kendrick Perkins uh, talking about Bronny James as a prospect. Here is Kendrick Perkins uh, on uh, Bronny James as an NBA prospect. Uh, Perk, I'll start with you. What's your reaction to Bronny James leaving? 
Why not? Why not? You should. I, it's the right move. I mean, when you look at Bronny, I always said that I don't believe Bronny is built for college. I think he will have he will be a hell of a pro. I'm not saying that he's going to be his dad. I'm not saying that he's going to have an all star caliber career for as a pro, but he will have a, a great pro career. And when you think about in the new day, like he's been around pros all his life. Hell, his dad is one of the greatest, if not the greatest a uh, basketball player to ever touch foot on the basketball court. So I actually love this from Bronny James entering the draft, testing the waters, working out in front of NBA scouts and GMs to showcase what he's capable of doing because he's ready right now. And I don't want everybody to look at what he did uh, for us playing with uh, USC. But I want, like, with his game and the way he's able to stretch the floor, his IQ of the game of basketball, his athleticism, the way that he defends on the perimeter. And, I mean, I, I just think it was the right move, Molly, to be honest. All right. Uh, agree or disagree with Perk? I, I do love – I love anytime anybody goes, I, he's ready to play. Don't watch him play. But if you, <laughs> if you take out all of the visual evidence, <laughs> he's ready to play. <laughs> that is, she did say that. Don't watch what he did at USC. It was like, that's all I can watch. What do you mean? That's what it is. <laughs> you know, I, I, his style of play does fit into a world. The reality <laughs> is he's not ready to play in the, you know, he's ready to get closer to that level. He's not a, you put him in your, he's not playing minutes for you in his first year. He's not a rookie yeah. who's going to be playing a lot of minutes for you. So that falls into, is it better or worse for his career long-term to practice a ton, work really hard in practice, and try and get better that way, but not necessarily have the playing time? Do they send him to the G League and let him get playing time there and try and play in, in that league? Uh, it's possible. But we know the biggest question is, if Bronny James gets drafted, there's two scenarios, and he will get drafted. He will, because yeah. his dad is LeBron James. There you go. It has nothing to do. Too, I, 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 I can't sit and tell you because I don't know enough second round picks. I have not scouted the second round enough to say, well, he's this much lower grade than the second mm -hmm. round picks that'll be in the draft. Uh, but I can tell you, he'll be a second round pick in the draft. Uh, someone may splurge in a late first round if they really wanted to try and get LeBron James, oh. but somebody will take him up because they think they can get LeBron. Mm -hmm. Uh, or LeBron. the Lakers, or LeBron will get LeBron to, the the Lakers to take him in a second round pick somewhere, or get it you know trade back and somehow trade cash considerations for a late second round pick, and Man. and pick up Bronny James. That all day, every, I would I would draft Bronny James with my first pick in the second round just to, at a shot at getting LeBron James. I would and that. and that's it. Now you know the flip of that is that it could be you end up drafting Bronny and then you get the phone call from a annoyed yeah, Lakers yeah. team that's like, we, well, look, we have to now trade for him. Because <laughs> because LeBron is pissed off that 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 Oklahoma City drafted his son and he ain't going to Oklahoma. You know? That is true. That's a great point. It can't be any team, but I think if you're like a I don't know, if you're a Houston or something like that, like I do it. I'm like, you know what? Chance we can get LeBron James here yeah. for a year or two. I'll take it. And so and that's and I think for Bronny, you really need to be in a place where either you're willing to play in the G League and and LeBron's okay with you playing in the G League and your team's oh, okay sure. with you being in the G League. Well, because they don't, they may not want it. They may want him on the roster because they may be getting in there to have eyes on the team. And they may be yeah. having in there, depending on how bad that team is, depends on how much he's going to get playing time and how much he's going to get sent down. But if you put that, if you say he's either on a team with his dad where he can go train with his dad and with the best medicine, the best sports science, and all of that, okay, well, maybe you can get better than you could have at USC where you're training with a bunch of guys who are not going to be able to, you know, he, they don't have the same technology LeBron has. And yeah. NBA has. So if you can get to that level or if you're playing a bunch in the G League and you have access to the stuff with your dad, too, in the offseason, th then, you know, I, I get it. I, I think unless you have a college situation that you're really, really looking forward to, you should LeBron should go in the draft because yeah. at this point, it, the story is only going to get more and more prevalent that he is not ever going to be LeBron James. Of course not. And yeah. we know that's the case. So even if he stays in college for two more years and he becomes the best three and D perimeter defender and he shows that he is a great role player, he's a late first round, second round pick. He's kind of in the same boat because he's not ever going to have that ceiling where that's what teams want to pick in the first round is a ceiling of a all-star. And I don't think Bronny at this point in his career and in the next few years is going to have a ceiling of 
all star. I think his, his ceiling's a little bit lower than that. Now he could be a really good player for you. He could be a, a extremely important part of a championship team. If he reaches his ceiling, you think about guys like Bruce Bowen or Robert Ori or guys like yeah. that. They were big pieces of teams. He could he could get to that. That's I think more his ceiling is that really important role player on a team. I think he could be there as a ceiling, but it, but those guys don't necessarily get drafted high in in drafts. If that's your ceiling, they want you to be a star player. Yeah. No, it's a good point. What's going to get him drafted high is that we got a chance to get LeBron. Yeah. So LeBron knows he increased his draft value just by saying, you know what? I want to play with my son. Boom. That was like half the team is going to be like, you know what? I got to consider it. I got to put him on yeah. my board in the second round. Uh, now, good stuff there. All right, we come back. We'll, the Wimby news that they want to get to, we'll do that and what the facts, what the stats, we'll deliver that Wimby news and get you some stats of the day right here on the broadcast featuring Patrick Davis on Lifetime Long Run. Rod Davis coming back on the horn.
All right. Uh, what the facts? What the stats? Um, how about this one? The Rangers. Rangers led Major League Baseball in 2023, scoring five plus um, in an inning 27 times. So scoring at least five runs or more in an inning 27 times last season. They've now done it three times so far in 2024. That also leads Major League Baseball. Uh, we always got a Victor stat for you. Uh, Victor Wembanyama became the second player in NBA history with at least 60 assists and 45 blocks in a 10-game span. Uh, this happened this past weekend, Sunday night. The only other player to match that stat, um, that statistical feat, was David Robinson, the Admiral, uh, during the 1993-94 season. Speaking of Wimby, I know you're excited about this, Patrick. The uh, the logo, the Wimby logo actually was revealed yesterday on Eclipse Day. Obviously, that's Nike, the uh, folks over at Nike trying to uh, take advantage <clears throat> of the uh, the total Eclipse. Um, they cross-promoted the Eclipse with a video that showed the new logo for Wimby, which essentially just looks like an alien. It's an alien logo. It's an alien a in a basketball. Yes. It's like an alien, alien in a basketball with yeah, yeah, the logos yeah. in it, and they did it in the crop circle. To show off the cool. the alien yes, thing, where they bend it into a crop circle in the field, and no, I, I think it's cool. I knew they were going to do the alien thing because that's been that's been Wimby's thing since the beginning, kind of. Well, apparently they're claiming that LeBron James gave him the nickname the Alien. So he did. There, there was a LeBron James interview where he said, "There's all these unicorns. He's not a unicorn. He's an alien." Basically, yeah, because they started yeah. to call everybody a unicorn, they're like, "You can't." If you're going to lump everybody else in, you can't throw him in. He is now a different breed of things. So, yeah, yeah, I think LeBron may have been the first to do it. I don't know if he was the first or he took it from somewhere else. He popularized it, though, uh, in saying that. And then Wimby is rolled with it. Uh, they had hats. I know Nike did uh, at his draft party uh, or when the, the draft lottery was happening. Mm -hmm. And they had hats that had a little alien on the side of them. Yeah. So they've oh, no, had it's, it's the, the cool little bit little, of alien. I logos. like it. I, I think it's cool because it took me a second to realize it was a basketball that the aliens in, but it's a basketball that it's in. And some people are saying, like, I don't know if this is true. I saw this. Like I said this could be rumor or conjecture. They're claiming that because uh, he got he's got a hundred million dollar deal with Nike, so he's going to be Nike's. Uh, he's going to be the Nike prince in, essentially for the next ten years or so, for the next decade. Um, and they said he's debuting his new uh, Nike GT Hustle Two PE, and that's a, it's a shoe that's coming up. Uh, the 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 Wimby shoe. And they said he drew the logo himself. They're claiming it. The logo he drew himself. Now, I don't know if that's the logo on the shoe or the actual logo they're using I know, in the crop circle. I know and that the, the, the logo he wore on his shoes at All-Star Weekend, he drew himself. Okay, so, so it may be that same logo about. and then the actual logo. Right. I don't think that was the one with the basketball on it, though. I think it's that's just not the head. one that came out in the crop circle. I think it's yet. the head that's the alien head, which is kind of not a huge, you know, it's not a crazy drawing. That's. No, it's just it's pretty simple. But yeah, it's yeah. still yeah, it's yeah. something that's I'm just saying it's something that's unique. Uh the caption on the video was somewhere in South Texas, and it just uh yeah, it pans down to the crop circle with the new Wimby logo. That's pretty damn cool. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. That's the, like the logo it. is legit. Like the man will lie, the logo is that's pretty damn cool. Uh, all right, uh we'll come back. We'll get into the national title game, the men's uh national title game last night. UConn winning back to back now national titles, monster rating in for the women's uh national title game. Uh, this past weekend, we'll get to that. Jerry Jones, the booster, turns out the report that Calipari may have been lured to Arkansas by some big money boosters and donors. BMDs actually may have been true. We'll talk about that on the other side. We got your horn headlines. We got it all coming right back on the broadcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Long Rod Davis coming back on the horn.
Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Austin is a great city. Uh, we all know that. It's one of the reasons people keep moving here. So making the traffic a little bit worse, but that's okay. All right. We all love this city for so many different reasons. And as the city continues to grow from people coming to the city uh, and the city continues to thrive, uh, so do our friends over at Iron Workers Local Union 482. Uh, they're growing and thriving as well. Many of the iconic landmarks we love in this city were actually created and built by the skilled craftsmanship of Iron Workers Local Union 482 like the Pennybacker Bridge and uh, DKR Stadium. And now they're hiring over 3,000 people for another huge project they have right here in Central Texas. They're offering competitive wages. They're offering competitive benefits, a pension plan. They even offer training for unskilled labor through their apprenticeship program. So if you've been seeking a new, exciting employment opportunity, or maybe you just want a refreshing career change, or maybe you want a new challenge, maybe you want to feel valued by your employer, you can become a valued member of Iron Workers Local Union 482, uh, this prestigious organization right now uh, offering uh, numerous uh, opportunities. Uh, and right now you can go check them out online um, and inquire about them at ironworkers482.org. That's ironworkers482.org. All right, welcome back to the broadcast. It is a top of the charts Tuesday. That's when Patrick the Idillionaire plays jams that reached the top of the Billboard's charts on this day in history. And uh, thanks to his creativity, I always learn something new on the top of the charts Tuesday. So we appreciate him on that. Also, Patrick does a great job with the big fat poll of the day. Uh, this one actually caused, like it always does, a uh, good debate on the show. Uh, Patrick, let the folks know what the topic of the big fat poll of the day is. 
Big fat poll of the day because UConn has won their second straight championship and Dan Hurley has said that he wants to stay at UConn and create a dynasty. We're asking you, which dynasty did you hate the most? And some of you are saying which one you still hate in the Chiefs. But then, you know, you get back. There's there's, there's other ones, the Cowboys related, Steelers, 49ers. You can go baseball in the Yankees. The Dodgers maybe now will be one uh, with Shohei Otani. If they start winning every year, that would be an annoying uh, dynasty. Then you go basketball. Uh, there's the Lakers, the Celtics, the Bulls. Rod is not a fan of the San Antonio Spurs dynasty. Yeah, I mean, it's not. I don't take it personal. The Spurs have just been. I mean, think about the luck. <laughs> oh, I the understand. Luck they've had of getting the number one pick, and then the character, of uh, the character and quality of the athlete they get. They get generational talents like Tim Duncan, and like Wimby when they happen to get the number one overall pick, when the basketball gods uh, smile upon them and even the character of the human beings they've got with the first overall pick, David Robinson, uh, the Admiral, the unselfish uh, superstar in Tim, the the unselfish low key superstar in Tim Duncan. And then now you get Wimby who's always dreamed of being a San Antonio spur, which is not something that American born players would ever say, but that's but he wants to be a spur for life. He he might get a tattoo, a uh, spur for life on him. Like he's that he's that devoted to the team. It's just I don't know how they keep doing it. They keep you can't keep doing this, but the Spurs keep doing it, and they, they don't win a championship with Wimby. We all know it's going to happen. We just don't know how long it's going to take for them that's, to deal. That's with it. that's the hope, isn't it? That's the hope. <laughs> if they don't, it'll be one. Of the, it would be one of the biggest disappointments in sports history. It would be, and the don't. reality would be yeah. if he left. He would have to leave at a certain point pretty early on. Yeah. And then He's, he ain't going nowhere, man. But that's the thing is, it, but it's like, it's a concept. Do the Mavs win a championship with Luka Doncic? You would say, wow, well, well, he's playing that. Yes, he would. Yeah. Uh, but then, but then also they may never happen because they're now they're really spread thin. They may be, but there's, I just, we'll put it out there. Is that, that's a, no, you're right. yeah. th- th- there's yeah. a chance of, you know, sometimes it just doesn't always work. Uh, but I'm with you. I think they will. I no no you're right. right. There, there are some there's some Miami Dolphins fans that are like, man, we said the same thing about Marino. We saw him first, <laughs> like, oh, don't worry, he's gonna win a few of those. We got plenty of time with Dan Marino. And it's like, nope, never, never won one. He's like, hey, we're just sitting around and waiting. So you're right. Under- I, I should I shouldn't say it like it, it's easy to do, but yeah. I'm saying the organization is such a great organization, the Spurs, and he's such a generational talent. You would think it it just be a matter of time, but you're right, Luca and the Mavs, generational talent, that's a quality organization. It ain't it ain't no guarantee Luke is gonna win a championship. Um, so yeah. no, you're right about that. It's all right. So I'll go the Chiefs is annoying now, but they just became a dynasty. They did. I mean, they just won, but the belief is that they're probably gonna win three in a row. And if you're a 49er fan, which my wife is, yes, you that's probably the one you hate the most because they have literally kept you from winning a championship. And you've had one went to overtime, and the other one you had a, a double digit lead in the fourth quarter on on the Kansas City Chiefs, and yet they've been able to win championships each time against you. So it all depends on I think how per, how close it is to you. Yeah, and the Spurs have been close to me, and I've observed. So it. I, I think a a texter brought up a good point of the Chiefs where they where people do it is tech fans have become chief fans because of Patrick oh, Mahomes. And so Texas yeah. tech fans in the Austin area now are all chiefs fans. This and so the, those are closer now to home because there's people that are here. And so they go, I already didn't That's want good. to deal with you were tech fans. So now, That's you good. know, I hate, you know, that you are going against me because I'm a Longhorn fan and a Cowboy. Yeah. So I did now they're going against you double. And, and so I get that, that, but I goes with your point. It's because it's close enough. It's closer. To... You're starting to see it more. And you're like, this yeah. is so annoying. And like I said, once the Texans, and they're good now, but once the Texans have to try to topple the Chiefs, I'll yeah. probably get more annoyed with their, their dynasty too. Yeah, and the Chiefs, <laughs> I mean, their ownership yeah. is also going to make it difficult to root for this dynasty as, oh, yeah, they, as their ownership yeah. and the Royals' ownership are both crybabying right now because they're not getting billions of dollars to make billions of dollars. Yeah. Even the Chiefs' players – voted that they had the worst owner in yeah. the NFL. The Chiefs players <laughs> voted him. <laughs> like, no, we're winning over here, but it's in spite of that dude. Like, it, they, no, it ain't. It, he ain't the reason we're winning. He's a bad owner. So, yeah, that's a good point there. All right, so I like that question, though. Uh, what is the uh, the dynasty that annoys you or the dynasty uh, that you hate the most? A lot of them, there's more dynasties out there than I thought. I mean, Golden State hadn't come up for anybody. No, Golden State hasn't come up. That's true. You know, I think Golden State would Golden be an State. interesting one. But I don't think yeah. it's because the – like the Spurs, Mavs, and Rockets were all not great 
during this run. The Rockets were trying to remember that the Rockets, Daryl Morey literally built the Rockets. He admittedly constructed the Rockets to beat the Warriors. That's true. Like, that That's true. I forgot. Goal. But yeah, I forget and about they were, those years because I never had a thought lead on them. I never thought I thought Daryl Morey built a team to win in the regular season. I I never thought they were a championship <laughs> team, but that's just no. And, and technically, it, the Spurs yeah. in that year when Zaza Pachulia stuck his leg out and Kawhi Leonard hurt his his ankle, and then oh. and then it was all downhill from there. I guess Spurs yeah. fans can go on that. I just hadn't even put it together, but yeah, <laughs> sure, screw them too. <laughs> no, you're right. I think, yeah, because I remember those Rockets years. The Rockets. There may be some Rockets fans out there that see that and be like, oh, no, the, the Golden State Warriors kept them from finally breaking through. Uh, but I'm with you. I never thought the Rockets – they did make – when they were up 3-2, when Chris Paul got hurt that yeah. time, I thought, man, they got a shot. But I never thought they were a team that, that could take down the Warriors. But they, they came close. They claim they came really close. All right, a good question there for the Big Fat Poll today. Go check it out on the text line, 512-447-3776. Uh, my man Patrick momentarily here will give us the horn headlines and get us updated and get us informed and educated on the big stories of the day. We will talk about the men's uh, NCAA title game uh, with UConn now winning back-to-backs. Uh, very, very impressive and just been a dominant, Dominant run by UConn. We'll talk about how dominant they've been. And also the numbers are in, the viewership numbers for the women's title game this past weekend. And it's a big one. And that John Calipari story, uh, it was rumored that the uh, the big money, BMDs over at Arkansas, that they basically decided, you know, that they wanted to uh, pool their resources to make uh, Arkansas a bit of a heavy hitter, if you will, and a player in college basketball by getting John Calipari. There is now more proof that that was indeed the case, and one of them is Jared Jones. We'll talk about that coming up here in this segment. But first, let's hit the horn headlines with my man Patrick Davis and get us educated on the big stories of the day. All right, your Hornet Lines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. The UConn Huskies won their second straight national championship last night, defeating Purdue 75-60, to completing a dominant two-year run. Purdue's Zach Eady carried the load for the Boilermakers early and ended with 37 points. However, it was not enough as the Huskies' defense smothered the rest of Purdue's roster to once again pull away in the second half. UConn now sits atop the early rankings to repeat once again next year, while Purdue looks to find a new anchor with Zach Eady moving on. Texas baseball looks to bounce back after a disappointing series loss with BYU last weekend in a two-game home-and-away miniseries with Texas State. Jace Loomis will take the mound for Texas against the Bobcats team that beat Texas earlier this season 11-10 in Houston during the Astros Foundation College Classic. In the NBA, all three Texas teams are in action tonight as they begin the final work week of the regular season. The Rockets will face the Magic. The Spurs take on the Grizzlies and with former Longhorn Timmy Allen recently called up to the rosters there on the Grizzlies. And the Mavs go up against the Hornets. Mavs fans will also be paying attention to the Clippers and Suns matchup with both teams closely surrounding Dallas in the standings. And in Major League Baseball, the Rangers and Astros split their series 2-2 after a 10-5 Houston victory. Romer Valdez was a late scratch from the lineup with elbow soreness, and replacement Blair Henley was put in to begin the game, giving up five runs and only getting one out. However, the Astros' bats were able to battle back and even in even the Silver Boot series. The teams will face each other again in Houston in a weekend series after the Astros take on the Royals this week and the Rangers face the A's with the first game coming tonight with pregame beginning at 6.30 right here on the Horn, and that is your Horn Headlines. Uh, thank you for the horn headlines there, Patrick. An absolutely dominant run the last two years in these back-to-back championships for UConn. Um, here is a, a little stat for you about how dominant they've been. So here is the margin of victory for UConn in their last 12 tournament games. Uh, 15, 14, 25, 30, 17, 39. And then you go back to last year, 17, 13, 28, 23, 15, 24. I mean, they have just been whipping opposing teams. And it's if you go look at the just the overall point differential, uh, combined point differential in the last two NCAA tournaments, they were plus 120 last season when they won the title, plus 140 this season, holding their opponents to 59 points in the uh, in last year's tournament, 57 in this tournament, and six wins each of the last two tournaments by at least 10 points. It, it I mean, they're, they're talking about one of the best 
uh, tournament runs we've seen in history, it's bo- probably a little boring to watch because it's not that competitive. But you're talking about a, a, a run of excellence, and you think, Patrick, there's some longevity to this thing. Yeah, you I mean, think- it, that's the reality. In today's game, you can reload really quickly. As it used to be previously, you had to recruit everybody and keep getting guys on your roster and bringing them up. With the transfer portal now, there's going to be guys out there who want to go win now. And if you're able to go out and get the right guys, you scout them out, you're able to find the right guys that fit what you're trying to do, that are culture fits, that are scheme fits for you, you can replace pretty easily. And you want to grab one or two guys from divisions below you. You want to grab one guy that's going to be an NIL pull in completely from somewhere else. Then you get in, you try and get in a really good freshman or two. And that's a reloaded roster completely because you figure you're going to have some attrition. Uh, Three of the guys, I believe, are going to be graduating as seniors. Uh, Then you throw in probably another one, at least leaving in the transfer portal or leaving uh, to go to the NBA or do something else. So if you say you need to add in four to five more pieces because one of them is probably not going to work out and then you immediately replace your roster and you're back running again. Yeah, no, it's uh, and it, and it's amazing. Um, you kind of point this out too that the they don't have any elite superstars really with UConn right now. Like, who do they have? They got anybody draft lottery that that's a lottery prospect on there? Or no, I don't. First I don't first round prospect. I mean, we know Klingman went up the boards with his performance okay. uh, defensively as a big man defensively. You know, they always feel they can teach you offense a little bit more. Uh, but I don't know if there's anybody who is necessarily going to be a top top pick. But again, this is a this is also not a a great draft. So I think there's going to be a you know you'll see especially early on there'll be a lot of foreign players taken. Uh, yeah. Foreign players tend to people they believe they have a higher ceiling because you just don't know what they do in against American talent versus uh, college players, which sometimes you look at and you We've say we know what yeah. their ceiling is. Uh, yeah. And so if we're taking a shot, and we don't know. Uh, but yeah, it's not. It's I don't know if they have anybody who's going to be a top top pick uh for for UConn but it, I mean they have good players on their team uh but they're just they're more built around good role players which are good guys to have in the in the league but not normally your first five to ten picks uh are going to be guys that you're going to take that really you believe have high ceilings you want to at least believe they have a ceiling of an all-star and that's yeah. where you get into at UConn really good players but how many of them could be all-stars there's a low ceiling chance for a couple of them Okay. No, I, it's just interesting. I'm with you. I, I didn't. I didn't think so, but I, I know you watch a lot more hoops than me. It, it is remarkable what UConn has done, and like I said, how dominant they've been able um, to be in the last couple of tournaments. And it's a scary proposition that just can kind of be the start of. At least Danny Hurley, he's and he's pretty say cocky, but he's confident um, that you know that this thing could have some some staying power. And I know he is going to be, or at least has been mentioned as one of the top candidates for the Kentucky job, the Kentucky opening. And he's already hinted that now I'm staying right here. He said something about ask, ask my wife if we want to move or we want to leave. <laughs> so when start, when do start mentioning wifey, it ain't going nowhere. That means that wifey must be happy there and wifey wants yes. to stay there. And, and also I talked, I brought, I brought this stat up yesterday. You know, it's rare uh, what UConn in terms of their basketball culture overall and their basketball uh, program, women's and men's. UConn is the only FBS public school um, in the sport of code database that spends more money on basketball than football. They're the only one that spends music football because of just the sheer size of it um, and the scope of it. You got to spend more on football, not with UConn. And it pays off, right? You know, I mean, they got they've won back, they've won titles for the men and women in the same year, and they've done that multiple times. And now the men are on the verge of their dynastic run after winning back to back titles. And we know what the UConn women have done as they just a dynastic program overall. So they they get what they emphasize. They put a lot of money and resources into their basketball programs, and there's no doubt it pays out. It pays off. Um, Let's get into the women's national title ratings because they were tremendous. I mean, they were really impressive. 18 point, if you go look at 18.7 million viewers uh, tuned in for the South Carolina, Iowa women's national championship game, a 9.3 rating uh, that would make it the most watched basketball game um, college or pro men or women since 2019. So it is a huge number. 
they also it also means that Iowa was a part of a record setting game was in a record setting games in terms of the audience and the ratings in three straight uh, in three straight games. Right. There was a third straight game where they set the all time viewership record for women's college basketball. So women's basketball having a moment, whether that moment can transcend uh, and really translate to the WNBA with Clayton Clark. That's a different conversation and rather women's college basketball could maintain this type of uh, interest and this swell after Caitlin Clark leaves, or is this simply just the Caitlin Clark effect and we're all caught up in the moment that we don't know, but uh, it's, it's certainly uh, a, an accomplishment for basically that game to be, that's the, it, we're in the midst right now, the peak of women's college basketball. Yeah. I mean, we're, and I, I don't, I, I, I think we're in the peak for now. I think it's going to be, and look, there, there will be better college women's college basketball. It will continue to progress as a sport. I, I, I said it earlier, I don't like the rating system and I don't believe that this is really a true bearer of how many people were watching and care about that game and care about women's basketball as much yeah. as it was people trying to be part of a cultural phenomenon. And yeah. so, that's these fair. are not people who will ever tune into a women's basketball game or a basketball game possibly ever again because they were just tuning in because it was a thing that they was marketed the entire time as, hey, if you're not watching this, you're missing out. If you're not watching this, it's your part of the problem. If you're not watching this, women's basketball is great. Look at the ratings and not women's basketball. Basketball is great. Here's the highlights. Not women's <laughs> basketball is great. Check this out. They say Caitlin Clark's great. Here's a picture. No, no, wait, don't, 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 and then we'll show, we'll show the shop from the, 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 uh, the logo and you can show stuff like that and you go, that's great. Uh, but you know, it's been, and I'll say the LSU game, I thought was really good. I thought the UConn game was really good. I did not appreciate the South Carolina game as much as I, I and I get it is closer. It was closer than the, the, the men's game. I didn't think it was ever really in doubt because South Carolina was just a bunch better team than yeah, Iowa is. was. Uh, but I, and so I think there's parts of it, but it, it seemed much more of every story, every piece of the story has been the ratings are great. The ratings are great. The ratings are great. Has the games been great? Man, the ratings. Check out those ratings. We're the highest rated program. And I, it, it feels as if it's all done by marketing people and not basketball people. And I get that's how the world works. I get that's what TV is and it's entertainment. I get all of that as a basketball person. It is frustrating when people try to tell me that women's basketball is now better than everything else and that if you're not um, part of this this trend because of viewing audiences and I say look I I we're not talking about the games though we're not talking about the you know what we're doing and when people ask is the WNBA going to take this huge surge I go I think they'll they'll get more audience which is great women's basketball is getting better but I don't know if it's going to be able to maintain at all and if your if your entire sales pitch is look how hot we are right now, it's hard to sell that the product is it really much better. Or if you just got hot at the right time. So if if it's just about ratings, that discussion to me at this point is getting overblown. I think, and the fact they keep going up, it's great, enjoy it. Uh, but for me, it's that's it, it's overrated, and that's also because personally, I don't appreciate the rating system uh, in 2024 that that's is fair. based in. We take one people, people who the people who are most susceptible to major advertising, the people who answer landline phone calls, the people who answer their mail <laughs> and respond to Nielsen ratings are the people who are going to tune into this. And in 2024, we should probably have a better rating system than what it is right now. It's very, very antiquated. Uh, that's so I that's there's there's more issues that I have personally with these things than than what I'm saying about the game because I don't want it to come off as me saying that that the women's basketball game because the LSU and the, the UConn game were really good games and yeah. South Carolina deserves credit for being the better team. And yeah, it's just the narratives have never seemed to match up with what the ratings are and all the narrative of what it is uh, for the women's college basketball. So I'm, I'm happy for women's basketball. I love basketball. So I'm, I'm all for more and more basketball anywhere it can come. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I keep seeing the ratings and it feels to be that there's people trying to take a victory lap on on the nba and on on men's college basketball that well you guys are now second place you're like i don't think i don't think that's the reality 
Uh, no, but I it, and I I don't just dis, I don't disagree with what you're saying because I we're not talking about the, the strategy or talking about the yeah. matchup between these scenes. We're talking about the phenomenon. Yeah, and it's a it's a great story, and you know stories are great because you have villains and you have heroes, and villains create conflict, conflict create storylines, and women's basketball right now has a lot of really great storylines. They got way more great storylines yeah. than the men. That's why they're going to get higher ratings than the men right now. Yeah, um, but I'm with you. I don't know if this is something that will it will will be maintained after Caitlin Clark leaves. What I will say is that um, the ratings are a way to quantify the Caitlin Clark effect. So I think that's why people keep bringing up the ratings. So I'm with you on that. Uh, But it's, it's up to really, it's up to Caitlin Clark, unfortunately, and it's, it's a burden for her. Uh, But yes, she's, she's got to take this phenomenon and she can't let it die at the WNBA level. And the hope is that, this will inspire a generation of really good players, women's basketball players that are young right now. And yeah. that in the future, you'll get, like I said, you'll get another Kaylin. It's like Michael Jordan inspired a generation of basketball players. And we got a Kobe Bryant and then you'll get, and then you'll get generations inspired by other generations. And they'll, you know, that hopefully that is the case that you'll get a young, another young lady yeah. who really can push the envelope. Of and, women and, I, and I hope that they can, push some of these other players and push, you know, more of more because that's the other part that it's, well, look, women's basketball is up because of this. And then you go, yeah, but did you watch the first round of that turn? Like we have to put in the, uh, the equation that it, the, you're watching one player. It is a Caitlin Clark effect. You want to yeah. see that spread around a little bit more. You want to see them be able to build more stars. I think LSU and Kim Mulkey and that pre R department and Angel Reese and all that did a good job of of building up and, and creating more people out of it you just need more and more names to keep coming out of it uh to keep growing the sport of women's basketball yeah exactly i mean that's i think we, it, it was the perfect confluence of storylines star power celebrity women's basketball just had it this year i don't know if they're going to be able to replicate that because kim Mulkey yeah. is very special and angel reese is, is getting drafted and they they they're the one to beat uh, Iowa in the national title game last year. Then you had to rematch that in the Elite Eight. Uh, South Carolina's had what one loss in the last two years. That loss was to Iowa in the what in the final four last year. So you just have all these rematches and all these rivalries. I think that also helped the stories and the storytelling and the storylines in the matchups. And I and even Don Staley, right? They're they they're approaching a dynasty. They they they're they're on, they're working on their own dynasty in South Carolina. Yeah. So you had for women's basketball. So you had that element. I don't know if they're gonna get a confluence. And then of course the car the Caitlin Clark effect being at Iowa, which was important. It's important that she was at Owl because it added yes. another element to the to the story yeah. that you know a, a a non-traditional power in women's basketball was able to rise to greatness because of her extraordinary talent. So it just it there was a lot sprinkled on that. It's hard to replicate something like that. And that's it why is. I say storytelling is so important. That's the reason people came to women's basketball this season was because the stories were so compelling. Men's college men's basketball, they don't really have a lot of compelling stories. So the ratings would be down. The NFL is the king of storytelling. Uh, they realize that, hey man, it's all about storytelling. So they get really high ratings because they're all about the the broadcast. They know they're a television product. They understand the game is supposed to be entertainment. And major league baseball is really bad at it. They don't tell stories really well. Wrestling actually. Actually, w- wrestling has been the best at storytelling for decades. And a lot of a lot, actually a lot of, I think, broadcast networks have learned a lot from wrestling about the storytellings and about villains and kill- creating conflict and storylines and heroes and heels and hero and the heel turn, all that kind of stuff. Wrestling's always been really good at it. So I think women's basketball learned that lesson. Storytelling. You're really good at it. You can sell damn near anything. We never cared anything about college basketball, women's college basketball, excuse me, until the ladies started telling their stories. And then all of a sudden we care. Um, all right, good stuff there. Okay, we'll come back. We'll get into uh, Texas football discussion. There are more nuggets coming out about the spring practice scrimmage over the weekend. So we'll share those and talk some Texas football uh, coming up when we go behind the burnt orange curtain. This is the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers coming back on the horn.
All right, welcome back to the Rodcast. Time to uh, go behind the burnt orange curtain um, and get into some of the scrimmage reports. Uh, there are a lot of uh, really interesting scrimmage reports coming out, still trickling out, if you will, uh, from the Lowhorn scrimmage over the weekend. A lot of them, a lot of the reports coming from recruits. It was a big recruiting weekend, and we saw a lot of the reports come from young recruits who were giving their take and giving their synopsis really on practice and what they saw and also talking about some of the standout performances. So that's what I love about some of these reports. They're actually coming from uh, uh, prospects who are there at practice. Uh, also, my man, um, Chip Brown does a really good job over at Horns 24 um, seven. I went and looked at some of his practice reports as well, and he's got uh, some interesting notes here. First of all, the start with the bad from that scrimmage, and it wasn't much bad, but one of the bad uh, stories coming out was DJ Campbell had to leave the scrimmage a little bit early with a minor shoulder injury, so I don't think it's really serious. It was more of a precautionary thing, but when DJ Campbell left, uh, Cole Hudson <clears throat> was working <clears throat> in there at right guard. Uh, so the depth of the offensive line already showing um, and showing and, and, and obviously paying huge dividends, even in spring. Remember when Suck first got here, they didn't even have enough offensive linemen to have an actual spring game. <laughs> and now you have the depth of, you know, potentially a starter having to step out at spring, at, at uh, one of your scrimmages during spring ball. And you can put in a guy like Cole Hudson, who is a, more than capable player who's been a starter for you and he can just seamlessly uh, fill that void on the offensive line. So you have depth on the offensive line. You got first world problems there trying to figure out who's going to be the starting left guard for you. But I think ultimately because of injuries, knocking on wood, hopefully you don't have too many injuries. You're going to need seven guys on the old line that you trust. And you're going to need some swing guys, some guys who can play tackle and guard for you, some guys you can, uh, you know, that can you can manufacture depth with and cross train those guys different position, which they do have. Cole just talked about it. Cole Hudson's one of those guys that they're cross training at different positions. I think they got like three or four of those guys on the line. And I think ultimately, Patrick, they want to be like seven deep on the line guys they consider starters seven guys they consider to be starters and also i uh, in the same report from my man chip brown um was that uh trevor gooseby actually had a good uh scrimmage as well he's one of the backup tackles uh, for texas so in addition to cam williams kevin banks being your frontline tackles uh, you got some of the young guys who are stepping up giving you some quality reps during the spring so they're deep on the line that should definitely be a strength this year there's no question yeah and i mean it's been a strength for them in years past too and uh you know you're lucky enough they had a young o-line you kind of built you know through the through recruiting more than you built through transfer portal so you were able to that's the group of guys that has been together for a little bit of time and then you bring in young guys now that are starting to step up and you've created that room uh but that's why you start with the o and d line when you're starting when sark came in that was the first thing he really attacked was that offensive line and uh, it's showing dividends now because it is you know there's going to be injuries you know there's going to be you know, points where you may have to pull somebody out and to have somebody ready to step up. It's just a huge, huge benefit. And, you know, if you're one of the running backs, you have to love it. You have to love it. Uh, Yeah, no doubt about it. As a matter of fact, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Chip Brown also points out, and this is something that my friends over at on uh, Texas football as well. Um, I saw them report. So shout out to my man, uh, CJ Vogel, uh, my man, Bobby Burton and Jerry Hamilton. Jaden Blue had a hell of a day. As a matter of fact, <laughs> um, here in this report from Chip Brown, Jaden Blue and Trey Weisner um, says probably had the best day for the offense during the team scrimmage period and the red zone work, a source said. Uh, also points out that C.J. Baxter, Jaden Blue, and Trey Weisner all had strong performances during the red zone work as the offense scored three straight times to finish the scrimmage. Uh, and I do believe uh, – those were touchdown passes potentially to finish the scrimmage. Um, but CJ Baxter and Jaden Blue and Trey Weisner um, all had really, really good showings running the football. Hell, you even had a running back commit. So that's how good the running backs looked. You had a running back commit, Ricky Stewart, after watching uh, the running backs in that scrimmage. So there's been nothing but great things uh, said about the running backs and how deep they are. I mean, we're hearing things about Trey Weisner, um, him fulfilling a role, potentially like a Keelan Robinson with that group. Jaden Blue is bigger. Now, too, yeah. he's gained uh, probably three, four pounds. I think he's going to gain probably a couple of more pounds before the season. Probably will be over 200. Right now, he's at 198. Cedric Baxter looks really, really good. And what I'm hearing about Jaden Blue 
is that he's running better in between the tackles, better vision in between the tackles, better footwork, running those inside zones, running those gap in those power schemes. So in addition to his world-class speed, which he has to beat uh, defenders to the perimeter, this is a guy also that now that may be a threat running on some of those interior runs too, Patrick, as well. Yeah, I mean, that's to have a two-back set is going to be really good. But we know that running back room has just grown from Bijan and Roshan setting the pace in that running back room. It feels like it's just kept going up and up. And to short choices, just kept that room, you know, at a high, high level. Yeah, the standard in the running back room is as high as any in the country right now. And the yes. Texas running back room. <clears throat> That's what every uh, position group at Texas has strived to be. Uh, some other reports here. Uh, from the, the scrimmage, I'm hearing really good things about the wide receiving core. Uh, Ryan Wingo continues to get really high praise as a freshman. As a matter of fact, there are reports that uh, Ryan Wingo was actually rotating with the top four receivers. Um, and I shout out to my friends over at Owen Texas Football, uh, where I got that report that he was actually rotating <clears throat> with some of the first and the second team guys getting some of those reps. Uh, that's it, just shows you Sarks will have to expand that rotation of wide receivers. I think that's pretty cool. Um, at one point, he's and I, I think right now he might be at four when you, when you throw in John T. Cook and uh, Ryan Wingo. And by the way, that's uh, two of the guys who were mentioned that had impressive receptions on Saturday here in uh, Chip Brown's report. And then you start thinking about Isaiah Bond, and then you start thinking about Matthew Golden. Uh, Silas Bolden isn't even on campus yet. We've heard great things also about DeAndre Moore, yeah, as well. Guys, that's, that's that's what six guys right there you're thinking about. So and I, I don't think it'll be six at the by the end of the season, but I think it's gonna be hard to keep Ryan Wingo off the field from what I'm I'm hearing. And I know he's a freshman, so he's got a lot to learn about the familiarity of the system. He's got lots to learn about refining his route running. So those are things that'll come. But I do think Stark might sprinkle him in, and I think Jante and Isaiah Bond will be splitting basically duties as your top receiver, your number one guy. Everybody says it's Isaiah Bond, but when you think about familiarity uh, with the system, chemistry with the quarterback, when you consider someone who doesn't have to get acclimated to the campus or acclimated to classes, but being a student athlete, I mean, Jante Cook's got a real lead uh, on Isaiah Bond to be the number one wide receiver. And he so he should be the guy that, to me, is either the number one wide receiver, not either one of those. I don't. I, I mean, I, that would be a little disappointing because, like I said, he's got a lead in this competition. The rest of the guys are coming on campus, and they don't have familiarity with the system. They don't have chemistry with Quinn. They don't know the campus. They don't know what is expected at practice and the practice uh, methods and how practices are laid out. All these things that Jonte Cook is really comfortable with. So we just haven't heard a lot about him. So I'm glad I'm hearing more about Jonte Cook in some of these reports too. Because uh, I think he's been under underrated, it feels like, and almost underrepresented in some of our discussions because the novelty of all these new players coming in at the receiver position has everybody really excited about the newness. And we're forgetting about kind of, you know, the guy that's been here and actually right now has more productivity at Texas than any of those guys they brought in. Yeah, you know, what we always talk about expectations. And I think that's part of it is John T. Cook, the expectations were you should be a wide receiver one this year. And so if he's playing like a wide receiver one, good. But they're not they're not excited about it because that's what they're expecting John T. Cook to be. Boy, meanwhile, Ryan Wingo walks in and you're not expecting him to be able to crack a rotation and he might be able to do it. And DeAndre Moore, you weren't expecting to crack the rotation and maybe he's going to be able to do that. And so I think the excitement comes from overachieving and, and breaking expectations yeah. versus a John T. Cook who could be completely on track and right on expectations but because his expect, because he's not doesn't look like oh he's going to win the Heisman at wide receiver this year, then yeah. that's that's what he would, I think he would have to be doing right now for uh, for be. people to be looking at him through a super high lens. And I mean that may also go to your point where you haven't heard a ton of good stuff about DBs. Maybe they have some DBs that are doing really well against your number one guy and John Tate Cook and doing pretty well against Isaiah Bond as well. Uh, that you have some really good DBs and that's why those other guys are stepping up a little bit more. All that could be factors in it. You always got to remember is it, you don't want it to be one-sided one way or the other. If everyone on offense is doing well, it's usually not the best sign for defense. 
Uh, Bobby Burden also points out Colin Simmons. Uh, so we're talking about defense had two sacks uh, in the, in the scrimmage, which is a good sign. We talked about how those edge guys uh, should be a strength. The edge rushers should be a strength for Texas. Uh, also, there were really good uh, complimentary reports about Trey Moore and also about Baron Sorrell and how those guys looked in the scrimmage. David Benda uh, supposedly is the front runner now to win that off-ball linebacker position opposite Anthony Hill. Uh, looks like you know, he performed really well at the scrimmage too, had some blitzes, had a sack uh, from the off-ball linebacker position. And uh, also Anthony Hill is another guy, another young player um, that they said looked really good at the uh, the scrimmage. So it seems like everybody, at least every position, um, at least is represented in these scrimmage reports and that they are showing um, signs that they are separating and elevating their game. Uh, wide receivers getting love, defensive line getting love. It says here in my man Chip Brown's report that Alfred Collins and Vernon Broughton also uh, looked really good in the scrimmage. So D-line, the linebackers are getting some love. Wide receivers, we talked about the quarterbacks, Arch Manning threw a touchdown pass to Amari Nyblack, uh, says that Quinn Ewers and Arch looked really crisp in the red zone. That's something that we should be excited about. Texas was really bad in the red zone last year, 120th in the country in touchdown percentage in the red zone, and they look really good in the red zone. Apparently had multiple uh, consecutive touchdown passes in the red zone for Arch and Quinn. That's really good news. We've talked about the wide receivers, running backs getting a lot of love. It seems like every position is getting love except for the DBs. I haven't heard anything really about the defensive backs, not one report, not from on Texas football, not from a horns 24 seven, not from orange bloods. I haven't seen not one report that concerns me a little bit. Uh, that concerns me just a little bit. And behind the scenes, I've talked to uh, some folks about the defensive backs and this should be the year where those DBs take their game to another level. And they have a really good wide receiving core to uh, re refine their skill set against and cultivate their skill set against. Uh, they have no excuse not to uh, produce this year and, and be more impactful. So if I'm not hearing anything in spring, it's not no reason to panic. Uh, but I would like to hear about them making more plays on the football. And haven't heard that yet. It's good that the offense is rolling. Um, but your biggest weakness last year was your pass defense, and that's that has to improve. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean that's simple. To. That's. And, you know, you can make the excuses that it's, uh, you know, the pass rush isn't there, so you have more time. Uh, you That's can true. make it that, uh, you know, that they're having issues maybe playing as physical as they would like to play. Maybe that's something they're going to work on. And, but, again, it, we can say hopefully that the Jonte Cook and and that they're, whoever, they're, they're helping slow him down and maybe they're slowing down Isaiah Bond a little bit. So maybe they look good against some of the guys we're not hearing the reports about. And so there, there's positive parts there too. Uh, it's not that every wide receiver is just destroying them every single play. No, you're right. Just because I'm not hearing anything doesn't mean it's bad. It's yeah. just that I haven't heard anything. And I know. so I, I'm, I'm, I did not reflect back on last year. And if I haven't heard anything, then the last impression was Washington. Yep. <laughs> and I'm like, yep. that wasn't great. Yeah. So uh, I, I expect that group to be a strength, though. Just because I haven't heard anything doesn't mean there's not good news out there. All right. Uh, those are some of the scrimmage reports from spring practice. We'll come back and get into a little off the record on the other side. Some of the uh, the wild, wacky stories from the sports world and beyond right here on the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Davis coming back on the horn.
All right. Welcome back to Off the Record. Another issue <clears throat> with a Boeing plane, a Boeing passenger plane, a Boeing 737. Have you been paying attention to how many incidents Boeing has had to deal with because of their malfunctioning planes? I have not. <clears throat> oh, man. It's a it's a thing. Unfortunately, it's a thing. Um, it is a Southwest Airlines Boeing 737 made an emergency landing in, at Denver International Airport on Sunday after part of the engine blew off. It is the latest in a litany of safety disasters for the aviation giant. Um, yeah, because if you haven't paid attention, I'm gonna try to go through some of these because I remember a couple of these have become now. This is just this year, I know they've had issues in like 2018, of course. Uh, that was the the disaster when they had two crashes involving Boeing's flagship 737 MAX aircraft <clears throat> and then the uh, the Lion Air flight in Indonesia in October 2018. Um, so that was obviously disastrous and very, very uh, disheartening and sad. And then they had other issues, I think, following grounding some of their 737s after that. But just in 2024, <laughs> let's just stick to this season, this, this year, uh, excuse me. Um, January 5th, um, they had an emergency exit uh, blow, blew, blew off mid-flight in front of horrified passengers on their 737 MAX 9 jet, um, and that was uh, in, Jan in January. Uh, they also, if you go look at it, at last month, uh, Alaska Airlines also reported that the windshield of another Boeing 737 MAX 8 cracked as the plane descended into Portland International Airport. Um, <clears throat> it also says here that came not long after a Boeing 787-9 Dreamliner over New Zealand plummeted 300 feet with more than 50 people hurt. Uh, and that was before a Boeing 737 MAX 8 operated by United Airlines veered off the runway after landing in Houston on March 8th. That happened. And recently, uh, earlier that same week, there were two other incidents involving a 737 engine, which caught fire after taking off from George Bush Airport bound for Fort Myers. That was March 4th. The second saw a 256-pound wheel drop from a United Airlines plane, a Boeing 777-200, shortly after takeoff in San Francisco that crushed cars below. <laughs> uh, the United Airlines Flight 35 was barely off the runway on its way to Osaka, Japan, when it happened, prompting the plane carrying 235 passengers and 14 crew to be diverted to L.A., um, and they've had more of these. I mean, I could go on. There's a list of these damn things. Like it's been happening all year long. Apparently Boeing 737s have just been, and Boeing planes period have just been breaking down. Um, another Boeing jet was forced to make an emergency landing LAX on March 9th. Uh, an American Boeing 777 carrying 249 people was forced to make an emergency landing March 13th. And so they're basically, they believe like because of, um, mismanagement, uh, and people cutting corners, potentially yeah. them not following all the safety protocols that maybe now we're starting to see a lot of these. And that may be something that's widespread across the entire company that may be starting to see a lot of these planes around the world actually start to malfunction and start to have some of these issues because they're not necessarily strict enough about the guidelines and stuff. So that's a thing. It's a thing. So what you're saying is I should, uh, if the next time I get on a plane, I should, uh, Pay attention to the safety demonstration. Uh, yes, you should. <laughs> okay. Yes, you should. Yeah, and they have some people saying that they they're trying to fly other planes other than Boeing's uh, types of Boeing's. I mean, I just flew up to Idaho and Spokane, and I mean, I don't know if you can abo avoid a Boeing plane. I mean, everybody's yeah. got Boeing. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what their market share is, but I'm pretty sure it's the it's the dominant market share. Yeah, I don't think I've been so, on a plane in. 15 years, something like that. 16, 17 years. I don't think I've been on a plane. Oh, really? No. Okay. Uh, okay. Is that just because you don't don't want to? or there's no, Is that a fear? Is it no. A fear no, I've been oh, broke okay. for a long time, Rod. <laughs> oh, cost money. They're cheap flights now. They're but cheap, no, but, a but what am I going to do? Flights. Am I going to spend I'm gonna spend all my money on a cheap flight to go somewhere and then sit for, for yeah. a while and fly back? People yeah. do that. People do that. People fly to oh. Vegas and do that all the time. They'll fly to Vegas just no. for like a day and fly right back. Well, no, but then I have to have money in Vegas. 
<laughs> you can win money in Vegas. You, oh, that? I can lose money in Vegas. You can lose money in Vegas too. That's true. <laughs> you can't. You can, and then be stuck and not be able to get back home. Yeah, yeah. you could. No, I, I, really I, yeah, I just I, I don't vacation very often. When I vacation, I usually just drive to the beach. That's about as yeah. It's about as much as I get away. Because you take Lou with you. No, yeah, I take the dog with me too. I take Lou with me. Yeah, that's why. Uh, yeah, you take Lou with you. Yeah, all right. That's a good point there. Yes, yeah, so you ain't got to worry about this then. But those who are flying, apparently uh, Boeing needs to get their ish together. All right, so we'll uh, come back and we'll get into big stories of the day. There are discussions that the Dallas Cowboys may be dealing with a looming holdout. Jerry Jones, the booster Jerry Jones. Somebody, that's a, that part of Jerry Jones' persona that we have not seen. Apparently, we may be, may be seeing more of Jerry Jones, the booster. We got Raj Rand of the day. We'll have Paul Feinbaum's comments and Raj Rand today talking about the Texas, Texas A&M rivalry. Another horn headlines. We're loaded up for the last hour here on the broadcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Davis coming back on the horn. Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Let's talk about Dr. Greg Eckert and his fantastic team. Uh, they are tremendous. I owe them a huge debt of gratitude. Went there uh, just for a cleaning, just for a checkup. It had been a while, uh, but they found something that could have been disastrous for me. All of my wisdom teeth were growing in sideways. Uh, could have been something that ended up damaging other teeth. Uh, and it would have been, if I waited a little bit longer, uh, it would have been a truly dire situation. But it wasn't. They found uh, that my wisdom teeth were growing in sideways, informed me about the entire process, broke it all down to me, educated me about exactly what would happen during the procedure. And after having the procedure, having four of my wisdom teeth removed, I was back at work within two days. It was easy peasy. And I owe my friends over at Dr. Greg Eckert's office a huge debt of gratitude. Uh, so it doesn't matter what condition uh, your dental health and dental hygiene are in, and maybe you haven't prioritized it where you need to. doesn't matter exactly what you need. Maybe it's something as serious as having your wisdom teeth removed. I hope not. Or maybe it's is something pretty routine, like a cleaning or uh, just making sure you're going to get a checkup, no matter what it is. General dentistry, teeth whitening, dentures, porcelain crowns, veneers, dental implants, full mouth reconstruction, even root canal therapy, whatever it takes to make sure you're getting the best quality dental care available. That's what Dr. Greg Eckert and his all-star team are all about. Uh, and he's always on the cutting edge of the technological advances in dental dentistry. That's what I love about Dr. U. And because of that, not only can he give you the best quality dental care available, Right now, he can give you a brand new smile in just one day. That's right. Permanently secured to your dental implants. No time spent without teeth. You'll get temporary fixtures so they can complete your permanent smile. And you're going to smile again with confidence and eat freely without pain or discomfort. So if you've been told your teeth need to be replaced, don't freak out. Just call Dr. Eckert and learn about this lifelike permanent solution, a revolutionary alternative to dentures. It sounds too good to be true. It's not. It's just like Dr. You. All right. So new teeth in one day. Day. Call in today and learn about this complimentary consultation. You got nothing to lose, but you got so much to gain because a confident smile can truly change your life. And Dr. Eckert wants to change your life for the better. So what are you waiting for? Give him a call. 512-345-3166. That's 512-345-3166. Or visit DrEckert.com. D-R-U-E-C-K-E-R-T.com.
Welcome back to the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. It is a top of the charts Tuesday. That's when Patrick the Idealionaire plays jams that reached the top of the Billboard charts on this day in history. And, man, it sounds very 80s. I know that. Yes. Definitely in the 80s. Yes. I mean, yes. I mean, you can just – it just got – it's just – Feels and smells and looks and it sounds like eighties all over it. I mean, so I, yeah, it's, it's mid eighties. I think mid eighties. Yeah. So uh, what is this? This is Rock Me Amadeus okay. by Falco. I heard that. Well, are they one hit wonders? Yeah, I believe Falco is, is a one hit wonder. Falco is a one hit wonder. Okay, man, the eighties. We thought this was a this song got to number one because you can because you could see I this but they just, like anything you could dance with a robot too uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> like if you just imagine that's like a point. little robot dancing to this yeah and then you're next no, you're to right. him dancing it, it's perfect man what cocaine did to that decade is amazing <laughs> like it's just <laughs> yeah it's amazing I mean, you still see this like what were we thinking during the 80s the fashion the movie plots the music it was just so wonderfully obtuse it was just yes a very very strange period but i love it there you go uh number one we the top of the billboard trust on this day in history uh thanks to my man patrick for all of his creativity uh we'll get to the uh potential looming holdout uh for the dallas cowboys we'll also get into rod's rant of the day that'll be the paul feinbaum statement about the texas texas and them rivalry some of it true some of it uh, not so true um his statement so we'll kind of sift through the detritus there and figure out what is what uh we'll also get into uh coming up here at the horn headlines the last horn headlines of the day patch will get you caught up uh and updated on all of the top stories there's also an espn top 10 ranking for the best coaches in college football. I think we got some time. I want to hit that as well because Steve Sarkeesian is represented. Uh, is he too low or too high on ESPN's ranking the top 10 best coaches in college football? Uh, we'll discuss that coming up here. Uh, before we do any of that, though, uh, my man Patrick always gets us uh, into a great debate or leads us into a great debate with the big fat poll of the day. So, Patrick, let the folks know what the topic of the big fat poll of the day is. Big fat poll of the day. You can join us on the text line. We'll get that posted up on X for you in a minute, too. 512 447 3776. Because UConn won their second national title in two years back to back. Dan Hurley says he wants to stay at UConn and start a dynasty. We're asking you, which dynasty did you hate the most? Which dynasty was the dynasty that you thought you could not stand, whether it's in football and it's the Patriots or the 49ers back in the day or the Steelers? Uh, which franchise there? Some people are saying the Chiefs now or in college football, if you count Alabama as a dynasty, oh, if that was to, one that you that you uh, couldn't oh, stand. Uh, if it's somewhere there, if it's basketball, if it's uh, if you'd hated the Lakers, if you hated uh, the Celtics. I know Rod is not a Spurs guy because of their because of their in, unbelievable luck in the draft. And yeah. Been there lucky, lucky man. It's crazy how lucky they've been. It's and I mean, look, there's also we'll say they've been lucky. They also drafted Manu Ginobili, I believe, 58th overall. No, they're good. They're good. I'm not saying yeah, they're yeah. not good. I don't want that 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 <laughs> observation I know, I know, I know, I know. to take away from the fact that they yes. are one of the most. I will say they are one of the highest achieving and one of the most well run organizations in all of sports. Period. In in, in the world, actually. Then combine that with some of the, the best luck that any organization has had. So to say that's why they're annoying because they could do it without the luck. They could have done it without drafting David Robinson, number one overall, and Tim Duncan and Wimby. But not only do they have the great, they have obviously great leadership and great coaching and great development, but then they've had the luck of drafting these generational talents who also have great character. Like David Robinson and like Tim Duncan and like Wimby, who fit the, the the community. They're so compatible with the community of San Antonio, which is its, its own unique thing. Yeah, right. Most stars are like, what happened with Kawhi? That probably should have happened with another superstar prior to that. Yeah, because that's just kind of the new that that is the the new celebrity culture of NBA superstars, right? My brand, glamour markets. I want to be where I want to be. I want to be comfortable. 
And those those stars that they drafted, Wimby and Tim Duncan, Ted David Robinson, not only were they comfortable in that community, you could argue they were compatible with the San Antonio community, that they were low key, just like San Antonio was low key and blue collar like San Antonio was blue collar. And I don't even know how they fit. But how did Tim Duncan end up fitting the San Antonio community and market and culture so well same thing with Wimby these guys aren't even from the states and yet they fit it so well and David Robinson too so I just think that it's, it's luck but it's also timing they're just the best at it they just and it's 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 upsetting to watch they, they can't keep doing this I just don't know how it keeps happening but the Spurs do it man yeah time someone else time. did go with your uh the Warriors here on the tech sign the Warriors and they said that because they tossed they tossed the uh, cost the title uh the Rockets the title yeah, they did. Which they well, did. At least a chance at it. That chance, right? but they they didn't. They the Rockets are never gonna win a title. That was Daryl Morey does not. Daryl Morey does not build championship teams. Uh, Dan Tony doesn't win. Dan Tony, Dan Tony, and Daryl Morey like you ain't gonna win a title. You gonna come close, just like they always do. But you will go. I know. I, I know I those. You on that. I know those teams were good. I just, I just can't stand the way they built teams. So, I, <laughs> yeah. No, we were coming. They were up three two, and then Chris Paul had that injury. They were. I mean, they they had a shot. They had a but I'm with you. I don't know if I ever believed. I don't know if I ever believed they were gonna do. It. I was always kind of shocked and surprised that they were like, man, they, they're leading the Warriors and playing with the Warriors. But I never believed. Oh no, they're better than the Warriors. Oh no, they they are a better team than the Warriors. They deserve to win that series. I never felt that as a Rockets fan. It never felt real. It didn't. I'm surprised the Cowboys didn't annoy more uh, people. But I think most uh, most people are Cowboys fans, so their dynasty yeah. wasn't annoying because most of y'all are Cowboys fans, and that's probably why that didn't come up as an annoying dynasty um the patriots didn't know a lot of people the patriots people had a few them? people on there the patriots have a few okay. people on there i'm because i i but again I, I think it goes too with where the chiefs are now is because of texas tech fans that there's people around here so it's it's yeah. a it, i think the proximity to what it was and how much it annoyed you it matters it did the 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 patriots was always annoying because people would take this team that was clearly dominant and be like well they're just a blue collar working class and you're like Come on, guys, stop trying to identify this team that's amazing and great that they're just plucky underdog for the last decade plus. They can't they yeah. can't always be an underdog and always win. They went undefeated in a season. If you're like, what a bunch of plucky underdogs these guys are. <laughs> no, they they it's it's Tom Brady. Tom Brady's done a great job of uh. being able to convince everybody that no matter where he is in his career. And what his status is, he's always an underdog. He is the perpetual underdog because yeah. he was drafted in the sixth round, and because of that, he will always be underdog. And then, like you're right, it seems like the Patriots that that blue collar mentality, it did it, it. It really was their persona as the underdogs. I was like, I don't know why they are, and you know why? Because they started out their their Super Bowl run like that against the greatest show on turf as the big underdog with the backup quarterback Tom Brady, and so I think that's why. And then they kind of. Even though that's how they won their first Super Bowl, they wanted that to be the perception when they won their last Super Bowl. And it's yeah. like, no, man, you, you guys are <laughs> you're, not the, you're not the dog anymore. <laughs> you can't, and you can't go on TV and constantly talk about how you're a dynasty and how you're under underappreciated. Like, you can't be both. You can't be an underdog and a dynasty. Okay. One of As those M has MJ, to go. MJ tried to do it. MJ's tried to keep I did, that going. And he's wrong yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right though no, you're right I, we even saw some of that from georgia i think this past that, that, year that underdog michael jordan who duke offered a, cha a scholarship and a starting <laughs> role and he turned it down because he didn't want to get offered a starting role oh what an <laughs> underdog story that guy is <laughs> no, you're right i mean it is. he had he had that one time where the the, the high school coach to cut him from the varsity team and ever since then it was like i'm an underdog it's like well, you're one of the highest recruited, uh, highly recruited players in the country. I don't know if you can continue to say you're an underdog because you were a late bloomer. You didn't make yeah. the varsity team as a ninth grader. When I was when I was ten, a twenty five year old told me he could beat me at horse, and uh, ever since then I've been an underdog. No, I've had a chip on my shoulder ever since. It's like, what, what are you talking about? So no, Shaq, you can miss me about Shaq that. walking around with that stuff. Oh, everybody's against me. <laughs> You're nine like foot you're the, tall, man. Just settle <laughs> down. Right. Ever since you were eight, you've been the biggest human <laughs> in any group you've been in. What are you talking about? Uh, no, yeah, but I think that's because psychologically a lot of – You talk about this with, with Shadur Sanders, right? Yeah, no uh, worries. Shadur Sanders is using it too. Like you said, he went to a private school, and yet somehow him being in a private school made him an underdog even though I, I don't, and that's expensive. The deal. And I, I don't mind the players doing it. I mind when I hear fans of it telling me something, and I go, 
but that's clearly not true. <laughs> you can't just <laughs> you can't just lie to my face like that. I know he can say that because he needs to believe it. You don't have yeah. to believe it. You don't have to believe it, but you're right. Uh, the, the fans do. They 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 throw that out there too. I'm with you. Uh, no good discussion there. What a dynasty uh, that annoyed you the most, or what dynasty do you hate the most? And yeah, right. Kansas City is probably going to be uh, more and more. I think you ask that question next year, the same time next year after the Chiefs win their third their third straight. Oh, I think you'll get a lot more Kansas City Chiefs, and I think you'll get that because I, as a as a Texans fan, I got a feeling that the Texans want to. You know, if they want to make this run and they want to ascend, they're gonna to have to go through Kansas City. Yeah, and but, but Rod, we, they're not ready to beat Kansas City. Well, Rod, we know the new dynasty is the Texans. It's, it's just starting. That's hey, I'm I'm with you, brother. I'm hoping that's good. <laughs> but I think to beat a man, as Rick Flair once said, you got to beat the that man. That is true. And I don't know. I don't know if they can do it. I don't know if they. I don't know if they can. They beat the Chiefs right now. But you know what? I think I think they will have a a playoff matchup versus the Chiefs in the next two years. Yeah. They're going to meet the Chiefs in the playoffs. And, and to do that, you probably got to be deep in the playoffs. And all of us Texans fans will have PTSD from that, what, 28.21, oh. 28 point, whatever it was. Twenty. I think they had a 24. 20, it was 20-something 20 20 20 point lead. They had a 24-point lead, I believe. I gotta go back and, to like, back. by half, it was already gone. By half, <laughs> they were losing. They had a three... <laughs> Four score leading by <laughs> halftime, they were losing that game. Oh. And I predicted, te- I predicted the Texans would win that game because remember they had beaten the Chiefs earlier that year. Yeah, they had beaten the Chiefs earlier that year in the regular season, and I predicted I was like Texans are going to win that game, and they were up by three touchdowns, and I felt like the smartest man. Uh, in and that radio. that that joy lasted so little oh. amount of time, just such a small amount of time. What was was it a fake punt? I can't. That started I, the. Downward spiral. I believe it was a fake punt or something like that by by Bill O'Brien that started the downward spiral and gave them all the momentum. Hey, I gotta go back and look. It was something, yeah, wait, something so was we, are, really we gonna, are we gonna call. track that's the play? And oh, from there on out, it was painful no, to be a Texans fan. It wasn't just one, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't just one play. It's like Texas football and the Colt McCoy yeah. play the national title game yeah. where he gets hurt. It's like ever since then, until basically last season, it sucked to be a Texas fan <laughs> for some reason. Uh, but tell you're right about that. That's a good point. Uh, all right, let's get to our horn headlines really quickly here. Uh, and get updated, educated, and informed on the top headlines of the day. Uh, then we'll come back, hit the seat lamb story, hit Rod's rant of the day. Uh, hit us up with the horn headlines, please, Patrick. All right, your Horn Headlines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. The UConn Huskies won their second straight national championship last night, defeating Purdue 75-60, to completing a dominant two-year run. Purdue's Zach Eady carried the load for the Boilermakers early, and then with 37 points, however, it was not enough as the Huskies' defense smothered the rest of Purdue's roster to once again pull away in the second half. UConn now sits atop the early rankings to repeat once again next year, while Purdue looks to find a new anchor with Zach Eady moving on. Texas baseball looks to bounce back after a disappointing series loss to BYU last weekend in a two-game home-and-away miniseries with Texas State starting tonight. Jace Loomis will take the mound for a Texas team against the Bobcats team that beat the Texas earlier this season 11-10 in Houston during the Astros Foundation College Classic. In the NBA, all three Texas teams are in action tonight as they begin the final week of the regular season. The Rockets will face the Mavericks. The Spurs take on the Grizzlies with the former Longhorn Timmy Allen recently called up to the roster, and the Mavs go up against the Hornets. Mavs fans will also be paying attention to the Clippers and Suns matchup with both teams closely surrounding Dallas in the standings. And in Major League Baseball, the Rangers and Astros split their series 2-2 after a 10-5 Houston victory. Bromer Valdez was a late scratch to the lineup with elbow soreness. In replacement, Blair Henley was put in to begin the game, giving up five runs and only getting one out. However, the Astros' bats were able to battle back and even the Silver Boot Series. The teams will face each other again in Houston in a weekend series after the Astros take on the Royals this week and the Rangers face the A's with their first game coming tonight with pregame beginning at 6.30 right here on the Horn. And that is your Horn Headlines. All right, thank you, uh, Patrick, for the Horn Headlines. All right, really quickly here, uh, C.D. Lamb. 
uh, is on the last year of his contract. Feels like we're saying it about every Cowboy star. <laughs> uh, Dax on, will be on last year of his contract. Say same thing with Michael Parsons, with the fifth year option, so he'll actually have two more years uh, under team control. But CeeDee Lamb is expecting a new contract. He had an All Pro year. Uh, he's considered one of the top three wide receivers in football right now. And Michael Gelkin warns uh, over at the Dallas Morning News, he warns that a uh, holdout potentially could be looming uh, if the Cowboys don't get an extension done with CeeDee Lamb sooner rather than later. He says uh, in his uh, piece with the Dallas Morning News, here's the excerpt, the Cowboys will start their spring workout April 15th, um, barring a contract extension that, when complete, is expected to make Lamb the highest paid receiver in NFL history. Lamb won't take the field. Um, at least that is the precedent he appears certain to follow. Lamb's agent, Tori Dandy, did not respond to a request for comment on whether Lamb will accompany teammates at Ford Center at the Star for the Cowboys spring workouts. But of course, Dandy and Lamb are aware attendance is voluntary for the bulk of the spring. Um, he also pointed out a quote from Stephen Jones uh, last month at the annual meeting in Orlando when he was asked about this situation. He said, quote, about him not going to the spring workouts, about players not attending spring workouts in lieu of contract negotiations. He said, quote, everybody goes about it a different way. We've had guys who have been around. Ezekiel Elliott was never around when he was wanting a contract. So we've dealt with both. We respect Zeke, but you prefer that they're around when they're under contract is part of the business. You don't love it, but it's part of the business. Um, so there you go. He's basically saying eh, they kind of expect this, um, but they'd like them to be there. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a passive aggressive negotiating tactic by CD It is a voluntary spring workout. So you don't have to show up. Um, and the reports are that he is not or at least he's not expected to show up for those voluntary workouts. Now, if they get into OTAs and you get into mandatory stuff and he's not showing up, then it's officially we're talking about holdout right now. It's not a holdout. And I love the new term. You can hold in, which I love now where you can go to the team facility, be with the team, go to meetings, just not dress out for practice. And they call it a hold in. You just hang around which I think is way more effective. I love to hold in. It's fantastic little you, compromise. You got to see me. Yeah, you can hang out and kick it, be with the team. It's like, no, nah, I'm not practicing until I get some money. I'm good. Yeah, I'm it, may, it, makes, it makes a narrative where it's like he's just sitting at home, just collecting yeah. a check. <laughs> this guy's <laughs> collecting a check, doing nothing. You're like, no, nah, I'm here, ready to go. You just need to pay no, me. That's a great point. That's a great point. It does better optics because you're right. He's sitting at home just getting paid for nothing. Yeah. He's abandoned his team. He's a bad. He's not <laughs> even with his team. Anymore. He's totally selfish. You're right. Great optics. It was. I don't yeah. know who had been at the hold in, but it's brilliant. But that's like. But that was the same thing with what they're doing with CD Lamb, where there there's plenty of players who don't necessarily make the voluntary workouts, especially veterans who want to work out with their own no. people and want to do this yeah. stuff. That happens every year, and guys in not yeah. in contract years, and no one cares. Uh, but when you're in a contract year, then the team will make it seem as if you are abandoning your team, that you have no care, not only not only for your teammates who have been by your side, but also <laughs> for your fans and your city. You're letting them all down because all you care about is your own greed. Oh, and, you care, yeah. <laughs> and that's the narrative that is being spun. But it's, you know, and, they're real, right and then they'll, that. but they'll, again, if you're not at those voluntary workouts, they, the team will make it seem as if, you are at home with a pizza and a beer, and yeah. you're not. You're just watching. Not TV. working out. Not working out. Probably got some drugs on the table. Meanwhile, <laughs> CD Lamb's like, I'm already in Dallas working out. Like, I'm already yeah. getting ready for the season. <laughs> I'm already trying to be the best player I can be. That's why I was better last season. It wasn't the voluntary yeah. workouts. It's all this extra work I put in to be so great, and I just want to be compensated fairly in market value. And uh, you believe that I should get, be getting paid about what Des got paid 15 years that, ago. <laughs> exactly right. No, it is. I'm, uh, no, that's a great point about the abandonment, though. They do want to make it seem like you abandoned the team and abandoned your 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 responsibilities under contract. And it's like, no, just uh, I'm, I'm here. I'm working out every day. So it, I think that's right. That's why I love to hold in. If I was a player and I was good enough to have to hold out to something, I would hold in instead of holding out. So well, that's, plus, that's my recommendation. Plus, doesn't the hold in avoid fines? 
I believe that is a way of work. I believe there is a way of working through the fines because you did show up technically. So they can't say you didn't show up. Now, whether there's a fine for not practicing, maybe that's got to be in your contract and be they got to be specified. Yeah. Whether you show up and you get paid for showing up or you show or you get paid for practicing. I don't know. But you're right. I think that is a loophole. Because I, I believe and, that was yes. the original point of the hold in was someone yeah. who wasn't necessarily trying to do anything altruistic. It was more they were too cheap to be fined, but we're hey. still not going to give it up. And when you know what, I'm going to. I'm just going to show up. What are you going to do? Are you going to do if I, if I don't put on the pads, don't want to practice? What are you going to do? Make me practice? No. Yeah, I'm here. Not, I know my situation. No, I I love the hold in. Hey, CD, hold in. Don't hold out. Hold in um, if you do it. But I think this will get done. Like We don't know. Listen, right now, this is a very peculiar offseason for the Cowboys. We just don't know what the future holds for them. And it feels like the Cowboys aren't really sure either because everybody right now is on a contract year for them. All the major players, head coach, lame duck, all right, last year of his deal, franchise quarterback, Dak's going to play out the last year on his deal. Michael Parsons, you got two years of control on him, but you picked up the fifth-year option, so you don't have to sign him right now to an extension or long-term deal. Uh, your new defensive coordinator you hired, Mike Zimmer, signed a one-year deal. It just seems like everybody, all the major players on one-year deals, and until you give at least the public um, some, um, basically one of your contracts or at least some investment in the future, we have no idea what the direction the Cowboys are going to go in. I mean, they could move on from Dak because right now, technically, he's going to play on the last year of his deal. They could decide they're going to trade or sign and trade a CD or a Michael Parsons because they haven't really invested in an extension either one of those guys. Now, could it come? Yes, of course, it could come for all of those uh, parties involved that I mentioned. But it's just weird that we if we've heard crickets about contract negotiations between CD and the Cowboys. Uh, we know Dak and the Cowboys are pretty much decided. No, nah, we're we're done for now. In terms of contract talks, we don't believe that's going to happen. So he's expected to play out the last year in his deal, and he's not signing Mike McCarthy to a deal right now until he show. It's a show me state, right? We're in the Missouri principle here, show me something. And then even Mike Zimmer came in thinking, and I'm sure he explained to him, "Yeah, man, you're on a one year deal. Why well, I'm on a one year deal? Because everybody's on a one year deal. I mean, it's so I. Yeah. It's a it's a proven year for everybody involved in the organization, and I don't I, I don't really have any idea or any inkling." where the future uh what the future holds for the cowboys i don't yeah and i mean yeah because it's still that if they do prove it you're screwed you gotta pay everybody <laughs> you gotta pay and everybody. if they don't <laughs> if they don't prove it then you just lose them and there's no value because you could have traded them and tried to get something back for them and get draft picks and then start to rebuild but because you you waited so long on this let's do it put everybody in a contract here to play with a team that seems less qualified and less able to be that team. Now they have to go above and beyond expectations because there's less of a talent on the roster. It's hey, I don't know. It, it, I don't get it. I I'm look, I, I believe that once we get through the draft and we get to like June, I think June, July is when the hype train will start up for the Cowboys. Okay. I think they're waiting a little bit because they don't want to hype it up. And then, you know, they, you know, Dax people or Micah's people or CDs people use it against them. So maybe they're holding that that hype train back a little bit because they can't hype Dak and CD and Micah on all their marketing stuff and then tell them they're not paying them. So maybe they're waiting a little bit on that. Maybe they'll get some rookies and hype up what they're doing there. I look if you're a Texas fan, I'm gonna tell you this. You're gonna love how much they hype up to Marvion Overshawn coming back from an injury. Yeah, and, I mean, because yeah, they're right. going to make that, right about that. They're yeah. they're going to make that him coming back from an injury feel like they just picked up a pro bowler. Well, no, really, that entire draft class, right? Because Mozzie Smith was considered a bit of a disappointment. Yeah. Um, Schoonmaker didn't give you much contribution. No. That tight end you drafted in the second round. Tomorrow, and Overshawn ended up getting hurt. Yeah. So I'm with you. I think they are going to hype up that group, mm -hmm. and maybe rightfully so, because they didn't contribute much last year. Yeah. Um, and you need right now, considering all the holes in your roster, you desperately need that draft class to hit on some of those prospects. Yeah, you need so you don't have even more holes on your roster. Yeah, you forward. basically and Schoomaker, I that's too because Ferguson's prominence came up and Mike McCarthy didn't great. use him a yeah. ton. Uh but you still drafted him really high. You did. And but yeah, but I think Mozzie Smith and, and Overshawn, Overshawn, of course, was the injury. We think he'll be good, uh it, it, depending on how they're gonna be able to use him. 
Uh, but Zimmer, if Zimmer can get him going, and what, if they can figure out Mozzie Smith, then that'll add to their hype train, at least defensively, that be. we can add these pieces with what we're adding in the draft, and, and things are not so bleak. Uh, and then it'll be whoever they get a running back. is. I think that'll kind of help them get that's a little more big. hype train. Yeah, that's going to be big, whether that's a draft or a late free agent pickup. I, I, that's something they got to figure out, too, and fast. Uh, all right, there goes some Cowboys talk. We come back. We'll get into uh, Rod's rant. We'll get to that fine bomb conversation on the other side um, and also talk about Jerry Jones, the booster. Someone uh, We haven't recognized that persona of Jerry Jones, but we might see more of it now uh, with Arkansas deciding to uh, pool their resources with their BMDs, their big money boosters and donors. All that when we come back right here on the Rodcast featuring Ring Patrick Davis on Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers coming back on the horn.
All right, welcome back to the broadcast. It is time for a Raj rant of the day. Um, Paul Feinbaum, he went on a podcast, that SEC podcast actually is the name of it, and he spoke about the Texas Texas A and M rivalry. And of course, it will be <clears throat> rekindled this year. And he spoke about uh, Texas's now uh, recent move to the SEC. And what he thought was some background and what might have led to Texas motivations to go to the SEC. Here is a Paul Feinbaum. Surprised. Uh, uh, because they they felt uh, that they had been promised that A&M would never come in. And they were promised. And uh, Texas would never come in. But things change. Yeah. And, and, and it's A&M's fault. You're supposed to ask why. Oh, yeah, yeah why, why? why? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, I was thinking it. that. Yeah. <laughs> One, two, three. No, uh, <laughs> the re A and M was so successful in the SEC, cousin Shane, that uh, Texas said we want some of that. I mean, it really, yeah. it, it, I mean, they Texas in 2010 was heading to the Pac-12. I mean, they had already commandeered uh, a bunch of schools because they wanted to be more aligned with the Pac-12 academics, uh, the Stanfords, mm -hmm. the Cal's, yeah. right. <laughs> what's now in the ACC. <laughs> uh, and they finally realized we, we need to do something. And Texas could have gone to the Big Ten, ACC. I mean, all this nonsense that we heard from, oh, well, the SEC. The SEC didn't do anything but answer a phone call uh, from yeah. their their attorneys answered a phone call, the same phone call that uh, – that everybody else got that they were, they were on the prowl. They were leaving him and they were going to go somewhere. All right. That's Paul Feinbaum. Uh, some of that is true. Um, I think some of it is maybe half true or just straight up incorrect. Um, I, I think ultimately Texas and Texas in following and i just because and had so much success, not on field success. I think what he's referring to is brand recognition and their brand growth. And now Texas A&M just being a more relevant program because of the the SEC now of uh, them uh, being able to uh, cross promote and A&M with the SEC brand and I think for for Texas now they're going to get the same bump in relevance not they needed it but they'll get the same bump in terms of their uh, branding and overall if you go look at it kind of the overall profile of the program I think. The Aggies, I'll give them credit. They saw that the SEC was a better destination um, for their college football future before Texas did. I think Texas was motivated when they saw the changing landscape of college sports with NIL and the transfer portal and with all the uncertainties surrounding you know, the NCAA and them being gutted and, and delegitimized right, as a central authority of college sports. And with all that uncertainty, Texas didn't want the – I don't know, uh, the incompetent, dysfunctional leadership of the Big 12, Bob Bowlesby, to determine their fate in an uncertain landscape of college sports. So I think one of their motivations, of course, money was a big part of it, but Texas had a lot of money forever with the LHN deal. And like uh, Red McComb said, Texas got more money than anybody except the Catholic Church. He was joking, but we know they print money over there. So it wasn't all about money. Money is always a factor, but it, it wasn't the main deciding factor. I think Texas wanted stable leadership and they wanted leadership with a vision. All right. And leadership that would secure them a uh, secure them really kind of safe passage, if you will, into the, the future landscape of college football as it relates to Texas and where they will be. And the SEC just provided the best place for that. The Aggies saw that way before Texas did. But I think Texas was looking at it for – they were looking at the SEC for different reasons. The Aggies wanted out because they wanted from underneath the shadow of Texas. They were done being in the shadow of being the little brother or the side chick to Texas, which I totally get. They wanted because Texas main rival was Oklahoma and nobody wants to be the side piece. And Aggies had become the side piece of Texas. And now they're back being the side piece again, which they never wanted to be. They were like, no, we don't want to be the side piece. We want to be somebody's main rival. And now they're back to being the side chick again. And they never really wanted that. So I'll give them credit. The shadow has followed them all the way to the SEC. And I think one thing the Aggies also uh, thought that Texas underestimated it was the power of the sec brand in recruiting you talk to these these 
these players now, the top elite blue chips like a Colin Simmons and like an Anthony Hill. And I've talked to these guys and I've heard interviews with Jerry Hamilton and uh, my man C.J. Vogel of Owen Texas Football. And they mentioned how the SEC was definitely a factor in their recruiting that Texas is playing in the SEC, they want to play in the SEC, that that was one of their goals. It didn't matter that much when I was being recruited, but I was being recruited prior to the SEC, SEC's dominance, right, of Tim Tebow and Urban Meyer, and then Nick Saban's dynastic run, and then the and then Kirby Smart in Georgia. Now the SEC, of course, they're the place where all these young guys want to play because that's where all the championships want. That's where all the guys are being drafted from. That wasn't necessarily the case when I was being recruited. So I think Texas underestimated. Maybe it was uh, arrogance. You know, hey, we're the Texas brand. We can recruit anybody. We don't necessarily need the SEC brand help us recruit. And they don't need it, but it helps. And the Aggies got that bump, too, in recruiting. And they got that bump in their profile. So I will give the Aggies credit. If you want, if, if the Aggies want credit that you were right about the SEC, you were right about the SEC. Congratulations. Now you still got to deal with Texas and that big shadow coming into the SEC. And now how are you going to make your relevant, your program relevant again now that Texas can brag about having the same advantages that you once did? Hey, now we live in the same neighborhood as, you know, uh, the Blue Bloods here in the SEC um, that now Texas can use the SEC brand to recruit and all those things. So I don't think that they came to the SEC following a &M because of their success. I think a and m success in the SEC in terms of branding, imaging, in terms of their profile of their program, I think that ultimately did show Texas, hey, man, we're going to get that same bump. And that is the, if you want stability going forward in college sports, that's where it is. Now, in the Aggies, I don't, I don't know if that's what they were looking for, but that's what they found. And the SEC and the Big Ten represent stability going forward. Uh, in the SEC. So I think that's ultimately what Texas wanted. That's what they got. So different um, motivations to go into the SEC for both Texas and Texas and them. But I'm not an Aggie hater. I said the Aggies would win 10 games when they went to the SEC. They did because they had talent. And there's no doubt they've gotten more money and they're more relevant than they've ever been. And that's be and they're recruiting better than they've ever recruited because of the SEC and because of NIL. NIL helps them too because, you know, that's that's not act like the confluence of NIL and the transfer portal is not also one of the main factors in helping Texas football be back in terms of their dominance in terms of Texas football being or uh, being back to the standard or playing back to that standard again. That's helping Texas, and I think T Texas A&M thought it would help them too, and I think it will. But they got they got to get the culture together. They're, they're way too dysfunctional now. Um, so that's yeah. that's my two cents in them. Yeah, no, and I, I agree. It's it's funny when you say it of, you know, the SEC is doing nothing. They they understood that they're going against the Big Ten, but it was basically there is no Pac-12 or Pac-10 anymore. And if you decide we were unhappy in the Big 12, we don't want to be here where we feel we're having to constantly try and lift up all these other programs and it points it lowers us to try and lift these other programs up. We'd like to go where we are being lifted up to, where we are trying to be, where they we're presented as, the top brand, as opposed to these evil guys who are holding down teams that we're not holding down, we go somewhere else. And so that leaves us with the big 10 or the AC or the sec. Cause the ACC is not really making the money and not doing that. It also doesn't really make sense to over jump, uh, you know, a bunch of, you know, the area where the travel is going to be much worse. So the sec travel wise, locate everything. It just makes sense that that would be the place. And, and so if you say, well, we want to get out of the big 12, where will we go? That's what makes sense. And so as much as the Aggies did, did well at their time, uh, the Longhorns did well for themselves in that point because they got a $300 million Longhorn Network deal that no other yeah. team got in the country. So it, it. as much as you can say the Aggies did great, it did not end poorly for the Longhorns either in that, in that scenario. But that it was time for that to wrap up, and so they made their next move. They were ready to go, and now they're coming to the SEC. Yeah, and you could argue that Texas wants to slow play it. <laughs> yeah, if you will, and that the long run network deal helped them slow play it while also making a whole lot of straight cash, homie. Uh, good stuff there. All right, uh, real quick, we haven't gotten to the story, but I want to get to it real quick while we got some time. So, yesterday, when John the news uh broke and it was reported that John Calipari was heading to Arkansas, leaving Kentucky, we talked about the domino effect of that the coaching carousel leaves a void there in Kentucky. That's a big time blue blood institution for college basketball. So they're going to end up poaching someone and the coaching carousel will continue. One of the um, 
main reasons, or at least one of the suspected reasons that John Calipari left was because he's got a really good relationship with some of the biggest boosters and donors uh, in the Arkansas program. And one of them is John Tyson, who the billionaire heir of the Tyson Foods brand, and they are big boosters and donors to Arkansas. And remember, I brought up Jerry Jones. I was like, Jerry Jones is a big booster and donor at Arkansas. He should have been in on this too. Uh, Pro Football Talk is reporting that Jerry Jones was. Um, that uh, that Jones' alma mater, Arkansas, has hired head coach John Calipari, and Jones' status as a booster has been cited as one of the reasons that Calipari walked away from the Blue Blood basketball program to go to Arkansas. So apparently he was involved, and they also mentioned that Broncos co-owner Rob Walton, who's also an Arkansas graduate, is also an Arkansas booster. And remember I brought this up, I was like, man, Arkansas should be a major player in NIL. They got Walmart money. They got Jerry Jones money or access to it, I should say. Jerry Jones money and Tyson food, you know, chicken billionaire money. This, those three sugar daddies alone should be able to put them at, at the forefront of the, uh, the arms race of the NIL space. And I think now they're, they're starting to pool those resources. We have not really heard of Jerry Jones as a booster. That's not been talked about a lot. Maybe he does it and just doesn't like to promote it. But I think you'll start hearing more about that. And watch out for Arkansas in the NIL space because they can make some noise, man. That's a yeah. lot of bread. That's a lot of bread. Yeah, they can um, make okay. some it's, but you can't, you can't have cheap billionaires. No, you can't have cheap billionaires. No, you got to be willing to make it rain. Got to be, be able, able to, to make, make it rain. rain. So that's what calipari has got to come in and you know, grease grease it a little bit. And you go, ah, hey, man, you got what, what's another? What's another three million to you? That's yeah, pocket no, change. But to it this is pocket change. To this young man, <laughs> could be, we yeah, we could be a national champions. You're right about that. I mean, between those three, I mean, who's got? I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of billionaires out there, but those are two of the most well, three of the most well known uh, billionaires in all of America, and they're they're three of the wealthiest. Definitely the Walmart family. And Jerry, I think Jerry Jones is like the second. Wealthiest NFL owner from them. Yeah, I believe actually I saw now, that. He's, yeah. Now he's like the third. Now he's like the third, I think, because the Waltons. I think he's like the third because they've got the yeah. Walmart people in there too. I don't think they consider them. So he's like the third or fourth. But still, that's a lot of money, man. That's a lot of money. Um, so if you can get Jerry Jones to make it rain and Tyson Foods to make it rain and the Walmart family to make it rain, watch out for them Arkansas Razorbacks. Uh, all right, we come back. We'll wrap it up, put it in the oven. Uh, well, first we'll play Who Said That before we get out of here. This is the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers coming back on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. We all love living in the city of Austin. And if you're a homeowner in Austin, uh, you actually own some of the most valuable real estate in America. The only downside of that is that the uh, property taxes are also some of the highest in the state. And many of my fellow Austinites, like you, are overpaying on your property taxes right now. And OwnWell can help you protest unfair property taxes and actually put, save you hundreds, potentially thousands of dollars on your property taxes right now. OwnWell believes that when it comes to paying property tax, you should only pay what's fair. And OwnWell right now can help you fight your property taxes. It takes only three minutes to sign up and there are no upfront fees or upfront costs. OwnWell will save you money or it's free. That's a guarantee. So if you don't save, you don't pay. 86%, I repeat, 86% of OwnWell's customers save on their property taxes. 86% of the time, it works every time. OwnWell handles everything from start to finish. They deliver uh, an average savings of over $1,100 dollars to their customers folks own well provides you with local tax experts backed by cutting edge technology and the best in class customer support to help you save money on your property taxes so what do you
you waiting for? Save money on your property taxes with OwnWell. Sign up in less than three minutes and start your protest today at OwnWell.com. That's OwnWell.com, O-W-N-W-E-L-L.com, OwnWell.com. Welcome back to the Rodcast. It is uh, Top of the Charts Tuesday. That's when Patrick the Ideal, you know, plays jams. That reached the top of the Billboard charts on this day in history. Oh, yeah, Informer. I remember this one. Yeah. Do you remember Spice the name of the artist? The Ooh, now that is going to be a challenge. No way. No way. Snow. Who is it? Snow. I probably should have got that, actually. I think I, I think I did know that. I think I did know that the artist was Snow. There you go, uh, man. Top of the charts Tuesday. This was a this was a strange one though. Actually, you had a couple of weird ones on top of the charts Tuesday this time. <laughs> and then, Somehow, and then, some... It's it's changing around sometimes because you know some of these this they stay yeah. top of the charts for too long, and so you don't have all the selections. And there yeah, was okay, other believe me, there's other weirder stuff I could have picked. Right? That there was, no, I say. know, but like I said, it felt like that was some really weird stuff, but it was good. It was weird. It was good and weird. Yes. But I always learn something new. Um, all right. Speaking of learning something new, we always learn something new in uh, our segment. Who said that? That's when Patrick plays audio uh, that he finds uh, sports related and sometimes non sports related. And based on the audio clips, you're supposed to be able to decipher who said that. So hit us up, Patrick. I just think we're in year two of 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 a of a, of a rebuild, man. Like this, uh, 
you know, you, you can, um, you know, you, this isn't, you know, this isn't the way UConn's looked. We're, we're on our way back. Um, you know, we got exciting young players. We got an older group of guys that are gonna that, that are gonna get enough wins this year that they'll feel good about the way their career ends. Uh, we got some exciting young players that are gonna help lead us back. We're gonna continue to recruit and develop and bring in the type of players that will bring UConn back. Um, you know, people better get us now. That's all. You better get us now because it it's coming. Wow. A warning. And that was back in 2020. That was actually back in 2020 after UConn missed three straight NCAA tournament appearances. I think they fell like to 10 and seven or something like that. And he's like, y'all, y'all need to, I'm telling you, it's coming. Y'all better be on the lookout. It's coming. And now back at the back-to-back championships, he looks like uh, he, he was foreshadowing. He future. sounds, he sounds more confident now. I don't know why. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know why he's got a little bit more bass in his voice. He's got a little more uh, ambage there wow. now. Yeah, no doubt. You're right about that. Hey, Patrick, thanks for all you do, brother. You are the real MVP. I want to thank all the folks out there for listening and participating in the show. Can't do it without you. Remember, the revolution will not be televised. Talk about it right here on the Rodcast. We love you guys. We mean that. Take care of yourselves, but more importantly, take care of each other. Until next time, peace and hook them.